Hello and welcome to episode 11 of Cryptid Ramblers. I'm Scott in uh, sunny, sunny South End, and with me tonight is uh, Callum over there in Basildon. How are you doing, mate? Hello, hello. Yeah, very well. Yeah, it's uh, just a sunny here as well, so uh, yeah, I can't complain. Yeah, I've certainly caught the sun. That's for sure. I've got me uh, my strap marks and everything. Oh uh, yeah, you've got me. Yeah, <laughs> got, got, got the uh, tan lines from me bra and whatever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's been a been a great couple of weeks actually, and oh, uh, glorious, yeah. interesting research, that's for sure, hasn't it? Yeah, absolutely. It's um, we were both looking forward to this one, weren't we? When we uh, sort mm. of announced that we were doing it, and you know, jumping back into it. So it's um, it's it's been good. It, I've found that I've enjoyed it all far more this time around than possibly when I did the first time, and I really enjoyed it then. But I think um, mm. as we as we discussed previous, we were sort of looking at this with a a fresh perspective or a different perspective, should I say? Yes. So, um, yeah, certainly, certainly, for yourself. certain things, yeah, certainly for, for me, yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah no, so, and that's, that. and that's, that's why I've, I've been kind of I've been eager to get back into it because of the various different uh, theories that we've been coming up with for our previous episodes, yes, and and also excited to see exactly what you think of it as well. <laughs> Yeah, because as we might discussed be. before, <laughs> historically you've been very much a well. I'll see it, you know, I'll believe it when I see it. So, sort of, oh, absolutely, you know, yeah, absolutely. If yeah, it's so. right in front of me, that's when I'll go. Okay, I believe. Yeah. And exactly, so this yeah. whole this new Callum that's that's come along this year, <laughs> <laughs> I'm excited to see. Yeah, uh, I'm this excited guy? to see what you think of it. <laughs> um, so, people that are listening, you know now either by clicking on the thumbnail or listening to the previous episode that we are going to be looking at the disappearances that are known as the missing 411s. Now, the missing 411s was, uh, it was a set of criteria that was created by uh, a gentleman by the name of David Politis. Now, I'll give you a little bit of background about David, is uh, he received his undergraduate and graduate degrees from the University of San Francisco and in 1977, he became a police officer with the San Jose Police Department, which has started his 20 year career in law enforcement that took him through into SWAT, patrol, street crimes unit, and even as a, as a detective. Now, he now he's an investigator and best known for his uh, 10 part series of books. Yeah. 10 of them. Yeah. Um, known as the Missing 411. Yeah. Now, he has also had like previous um, investigations into um, the big guy himself, Bigfoot. Yeah, his first book was actually on the, on the book. big guy, yeah. Yeah, he did two books um, mm. on Bigfoot. Mm. But his first one was on the big man himself. Yeah. Now, the Missing 411 stuff, uh, the first book was published in 2012. Mm. But his work on the subject began in 2009 when he was approached by a park ranger. Now, he was uh, doing a talk about um, about Bigfoot and this park ranger actually came to him and said, well, I'll tell you what, there's, there's a lot of strange disappearances that are that we can't explain. Um, and also the uh, United States Forest Service, mm. they're not they're not um, tracking it either. They're no. just brushing it under the carpet. There's something going on here. He's come up with um, 11 points of criteria. Not all yeah. of these boxes get ticked, though, in, in every case, no. but enough of them, enough of them to get yeah. ticked would bring it underneath the case file. I'd say it's probably three, probably three or four minimum, I would say, in each each and every case. I think yeah. they're sort of ticked off as a, as a definite kind of, you know, this is what's happened or this is the criteria that it's met. So there are mm. definitely... A lot of um, yeah, sort of synchronicities between a lot of them for that for that reason. Yeah, yeah, and this yeah. this park ranger in particular was mostly talking about the disappearances that happen in and around national forests out in the states. That's right. um, it was interesting it because that, he he knew he knew Politis, didn't he? He knew that he was a, a detective, and that's right. Did he, did he see him walking in one of the parks and sort of stopped him and said, "Oh, like you know, I know you're a detective, you know." Have I got some um, for you? Sort of thing, wasn't it? It was. Well, it was that. actually. Was that a Bigfoot talk? It was that a Bigfoot talk. I was which, right. Okay. Yeah, but ah, uh, you are right though. There was another park ranger that did talk to him whilst he was walking through. 
right um, okay. a national uh, one of the trials yeah you are right yeah so it right, has okay. happened on both two occasions park yeah, rangers. Yeah. yes oh, okay right yeah so the criterias are as such so we've got one is that there is a point of separation um that could be something as simple as um someone walking off on the trail in a certain direction yeah um it's all right i'll catch up with you yeah then by the time you follow that trail they disappeared or it could be within a blink of an eye you turn around suddenly quite literally yeah they're gone yeah um yeah. time of disappearance so usually they disappear broad daylight that's what a lot of the cases seem to be um they're usually within close proximity of a boulder field yeah that's right um or a rock field of such mm -hmm. Um, they're I often think scree as well. They call it a scree field, which is basically That's just right, a lot of yeah. loose sort of shrapnel, I guess, stones and slate got, and, and that kind of I thing. It kind of be like, like, like we get gravel driveways, that sort of thing. But yeah, but yeah bigger, pretty much like that. Much larger rocks. scale. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, a lot of disappearances often happen with like near water yeah. or within 150 miles of a large body of water. Mm um now that's a little bit different from us in the uk because yeah, just we're no we're no uh further away than 57 miles away from water mm. <laughs> or a large yeah. body of water where we are yeah but exactly, yeah. apparently some of these disappearances happen here in our national forests as well um right, okay. it'd be interesting. interesting to go into at a later date but yeah we've definitely mostly concentrated stateside yeah so that's four of the criteria the yeah, fifth one right. being a weather event yeah Six being the person who's disappeared either has a disability or an illness. Yep, that's right. Um, seven, canines can't track it. No. They can't track the person. They can only track them up and to a point, and then it's suddenly Stops, like they vanish. goes cold, yeah. Number eight is they're found in an area that's previously been searched. So either the um, the person that's disappeared has been found in the, in the area, has been searched before, or an item that was mm -hmm. in their possession yeah a very very strange occurrence very um right. and that that comes up in pretty much if any if something's found then it comes up in the case it's in an area that's been searched many times before yeah um number nine being that there's missing clothing yeah number 10 is an unknown cause of death or confusion around the cause of death yeah and 11 being that it's within a geographical clustering so what that means is that there's been several people in that area that have disappeared under, under these the same similar yeah. sort of circumstances yeah now is, uh, very odd yeah yes yeah uh, that's and that's the thing this is what has driven him to it is that he's found these odd occurrences and he's also noted that the park authorities don't want anything to do with it it's their jurisdiction but they don't want anything they don't to do with it. it yeah which is weird but it's they, very weird but they don't even, they don't even either. Yeah. exactly they don't even they don't, they don't even have a like, missing persons list you go no. to any city or, or county or, or, or anything like that that isn't a park a national park and they've got a list of missing people you can get it within minutes apparently like one of the absolutely ex-detectives in the documentary said you know if, when i was you know the head of the police you know i could i could have a file in my lap in within minutes of you know local you know kind of missing people so i think that's part of why he got involved because it, it adds to the kind of the mystery of these disappearances that the the the, the you know the, the national um was it the mps is it the national no f for it national forest the Some united states there. forest um service yeah so they, yeah. they they don't yeah they don't necessarily sort of investigate them or, or keep a log of them it's mm. pretty much down to the jurisdiction of the local kind of sheriff's department if they decide to take it on then it's kind of left with them to you know to kind of um yeah sort out <clears throat> and most of the, most of the time the the formal searches of the area only last tops of 10 days I don't think any of the ones that we're going to feature no, I now, I think so. the longest one goes on like eight days. Eight days, yeah, I think I think so, yeah. I think and that's right. when the formal search stopped. And then it's up yeah. to it's up to individuals to go out there and have a look. Yeah, it's up to a lot of volunteers or the family of the of the missing to, you know, mm. sort of elongate that uh, that search. But um but I suppose for like those a... got go on, mate, sorry. Yeah, sorry, I was just I was gonna say that it is it's not 
like I said before, it's not just um, located to the North American continent, it is worldwide. Um, but it is also very important to note, there are some things that um, dismiss it from being a 411 case. And there are four very, very particular things. Um, the first one being mental health. Yeah. So, um, or mental mental illness, should I say, um, historically or otherwise. Yeah. Um, evidence of criminal activity. Yeah. Uh, voluntary disappearance. So whether that... Run, runaways, that kind of thing. Yeah, people that yeah. are prone to just up and, and go. Yeah. Um, and the last one is animal predation. So any signs of an animal attack. Yeah. They but this is something that's... A, yeah. Absolutely. This is something that's really, really worthwhile because obviously the North American wilderness is full of uh, mountain lions, bears, yeah, the, the giant, the big cats, big yeah. big predators, basically wolves. Yeah, bobcats, wolves, bears. Yeah, they are more than capable of killing S- a, a human. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, but that's that is that's probably the most important one because it seems like that seems to be the most. important um not popular the most occurring mm. um explanation for these disappearances oh it was a cat attack or yeah. something like that yeah, that is interesting because yeah, as you say that <clears throat> it's the fourth criteria for it to not be a missing 411 case yet it's the most used uh mm. excuse or, or or reasoning for why this person you know disappeared and then you speak to local experts and survivalists and and mm. whatnot and they all say well, no, we don't really get those in this area, or you know, if absolutely, and this is the thing that's got a them, wide you don't see of... them, or exactly. Yeah. And there's a wide range of people that do go missing. Look, like you get very, very experienced wilderness people that are going missing, um, adults, children, very, very young children mm. as well that are going missing, yeah, which, who would be more vulnerable to animal attacks, but there's yeah. a, a distinct lack of evidence of animal attacks and um, now i know that you came across quite a few stories yeah well there's a, to young there's a few yeah there's a few obviously in the in the documentary um and i can't i think we did mention it in the at the end of the last episode but for those that maybe didn't hear um dave Politas basically did two um documentaries he, he led with the first one which was the missing 411 uh, and that basically covers strange disappearances um, following the 11 points of, of the criteria um, mm. that predominantly happened to uh, basically children, um, I think from as young as two. And I think the oldest was uh, 10 years old, I think, uh, from what yeah, we're going to really, cover. And then, and then later on, we're going to go over the second documentary, which is The Missing 411, The Hunted, which basically covers adults, experienced hikers and hunters um within the same sort of regions that also just uh that also just disappeared um and because i didn't instantly kind of know this i think it might be worth sort of sharing but the yeah, reason why it's it. called the missing 411 <clears throat> is because 411 is a code used predominantly in the united states which basically just means information so it's like a a directory on people um to the point where I think where you can you can actually dial four one one in the states and you can request information on someone. That's right. So yeah. yeah so the reason so it's essentially called the, the missing information, but mm. it obviously sounds a bit. Uh, yeah, there's that uh, that saying when they say like you meet you might meet your friend. We go, you're right. How you doing? What's new? Yeah. They they say what's the four one one. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. You know what's the deep? Yeah. What's yeah, going what's, on? Yeah. Yeah. What's yeah, the four exactly. one one? Yeah. So um, yeah. So I thought because that didn't instantly sort of become apparent, sort of to me, anyone so that I, isn't stateside. So I did have to look into it. So yeah, that that's why it's called um, yeah, missing four one one. But yeah, just yeah, jumping j- jumping straight into it. I guess um, we're going to go over. Um, uh, I think it's about five um, disappearances, uh, which are sort of five of the main ones that uh, Dave Politis goes over in the uh, the documentary just to kind of go over the the disappearances the circumstances and and just mm. to kind of bring light to the fact that these are mysterious i guess that you know they're unexplained um which some have had sort of closure um and some to this day still haven't 
um, and uh, we're going to go over both aspects even, of, of those. Even with the you know remains being found, sometimes there still is with, any yeah, closure. With, with and re- without remains, yeah, exactly, yeah, uh, yeah, because I guess yeah they find the remains, but they still don't find out how it happened, why it no. happened, and, and and that kind of thing. But uh, the first one we're going to um, jump into, um, which is also still technically an open case, mm. um, occurred on the 10th of July in 2015 in uh, Lador, Idaho, and uh, it involved uh, little Dior Coons Jr., um, two-year-old mm. lad. Um, <clears throat> it's, yeah, it, was, it hits, um, you, know, for, you know, for yourself as, as well, it hits a little bit yeah. close to home, this one, because obviously we've both had... Uh, we've both got lad you know little boys and uh yeah. you know mine's not much older than uh than what dior was when he went missing so it's uh yeah it's a bit it's of very a, close to home then isn't yeah it, really? exactly yeah um so yeah so he was on he was essentially on a camping trip um with uh with his parents and his uh grandpa and his grandpa's friend um now where they were going was it was a remote campsite uh it was about seven miles off the beaten track from the town of Lador. Um, and it, it took you sort of, I think it was about 45 minutes or something to drive this road because of how uh, horrid the terrain was basically. It, so, yeah. It was incredibly rough. Like you, rocky, you couldn't yeah. really do anything above 10 or 15 mile. An no, hour. not without, yeah. Not without shunting your axle out the front of the <laughs> <Yeah>. car. <laughs> that's with, and that's with those big old. And that's with the big old. There. Yeah, which is what they had. They had the big, you know, sort of pick up four by four thing, which you'd imagine would be able to, you know, drive over that with no problem. But, mm. you know, even watching the investigators drive up it, you know, they were P rolling along at, yeah, as you say, mm. sort of 10, you know, sort of mile and an it, hour. And what's, what's, I think was really interesting timing was that the documentary crew were in the area when this disappearance occurred. Yes, they weren't even there so to originally investigate this case, yeah. but they heard of it they heard that it sort of happened and quickly learned of the circumstances. And so uh, Pelidis and his crew kind of shot down there because he, in the documentary, they show kind of real time footage of them filming the uh, search parties mm. and the, the sheriffs sort of talking to everyone and telling them how they're going to search and what areas yeah, they're going to go to. It wasn't and... like uh, the, the news B roll or anything like that. It was, actual real footage from the documentary yeah, no, it was group. yeah it was sort of real real time sort of footage um now they they got to this campsite the the grandpa had been there for the majority of his life took you know his uh his daughter who was dior's mum when she was little so they'd, they'd been there you know sort of quite um quite often gone granddaughter granddaughter so of course it is yeah yeah um and so yeah, they they set up at this camp. Um, they realise that they need to get fuel for the truck. So the mum and dad decide to basically jump back in the truck and drive the forty five minutes back to the door mm. to get some supplies and to fill up. Get the, now, get why the they didn't do what they need to why do? Why they didn't do that on the way in is is probably quite a interesting question. But we'll come on to that, I guess, a bit later. Yeah, but yeah. when we go yeah. into the subsequent information um so the little boy stays back with the the grandpa and and their friend who or his friend sorry who was um they were basically preparing to uh, fish uh the parent <coughs> excuse me the parents come back uh, about 45 minutes later and um they all yeah all get their, their fishing equipment ready and head down to um the local creek mm. so the fr- the grandpa's friend isaac is already down there with his lines kind of set up and you know, in, in a you know good spot to catch only him. like you know, I something, think something like a hundred yards away as well. So fifty it's... to a hundred yards, so really not that far. You could see the camp from the creek. Um, that mm. that's how sort of close that it was. Um, the parents went to go to the the creek, set up their own lines, and also see um, you know keep kind of if there were any fish because uh, Dior Junior liked fish. So they if they found any, they were going to go and get him to sort of come follow but he wanted to stay back in the camp initially with the grandpa because the grandpa always had a stash of candy on him yeah so he obviously that that's where his loyalty S- lay at the time the sweets exactly right um now between the mum and dad deciding to walk down to the creek and the little boy deciding that he was going to turn back and essentially go back to the grandpa in the in the the uh, camp 
mm-hmm. he he vanished. <clears throat> oh, disappeared. Gone. Just up. Yeah. No. No. Uh, and, and there was really. I mean, you'll have to watch the documentary, I guess, to um, really kind of see how remote it was. But there was nowhere mm. for the lad to go without being seen or found because it was just completely. It's just completely open wilderness uh essentially yeah. you know as, as, aside from the you know the, the sort of the enclosed creek which is obviously under you know under uh there's a bit of tree you know, sort of cover trees and, 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 such and like a canopy of, of sort of trees and then you know right opposite that was a vast you know sort of boulder field which again for the most part was exposed mm. um and bear in mind this this lad's only two years old so and he, he just, ain't going he far just, is he? he's not going far no and he, he quite literally just upped and vanished um you know, they the, the parents found some uh, minnow trapped in a part of the creek, and the dad mm. thought, "Oh well, your junior would love this. I'll go and get him." So he walks up a up, walks up the bank uh, to face the the campsite, calls out to the the grandfather. Um, you know, where's little Dior? Um, and he's like, oh, he's just over there. And he looks to where he was pointing, and of course, the the kid's not there. Yeah. Um, and that's that's really kind of where the uh, that's really where the the kind of the mystery starts for, for you know for his um, you know sort of disappearance. But you know that's already right. we've picked out you know some of the you know eleven criteria. You know it was mm-hmm. the point of separation that he disappeared near yeah. a body of water, or, yeah. i.e. the the creek. Um, and what were the other ones? The well during the <clears throat> during the search, mm. canines could not track. No, that's right. They movements. got as far as the creek uh, and couldn't couldn't kind of sniff any 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 further. And the thing is, that, mm. uh, and other than the tracker dogs, they had trackers. They had you know ground crew searching for them. And some of these people were you know experienced trackers and hikers and whatever. Couldn't find any right. prints. Couldn't find any belongings. It was broad you know, daylight as well. Jacket, cl- yeah, and it was broad daylight as well. And you know that they they tried to use. Um, you know, they tried to use the reasoning for him disappearing was that someone drove up from the town to snatch him, like it was a planned abduction. But a private yeah. investigator was just like, that wouldn't happen. There's only one so road. It's not in. plausible. Yeah, no, it's not there's... Plausible. Like you say, there's only one road and it ends at the campsite. Yeah, it's a dead end. So, yeah, you'd have to drive directly into the campsite where you would get heard or seen. And there's only one way out, which is back down that road. So people yeah. would have seen someone driving up or down, um, you know, within that, that time scale. And, and it just didn't, you know, it just didn't happen until the, the sheriff and other authorities turned up their you know, news crews and whatever else there wasn't, there wasn't anyone else, you know, that's, anyone else that's, there. That's the one thing that, that is great about uh, a lot of these disappearances is that within hours of it being called in yeah. there's search and rescue on site oh yeah you know and they're, dogs, they're pulling in multiple crew. teams of dogs yeah. ground crew in a lot of cases helicopters as well helicopters you yeah. know they they literally they scan the area thick and thin and... i mean yeah i mean exactly i mean to this point they you know they they check um they check the creek you know they've got searchers on their hands and knees basically scouring the entire length of the uh, the creek they it's not even search. a particularly deep creek either is it you know it's not talking like inches. high yeah you know so yeah if unfortunately you know i mean you can drown in an inch of water yeah of course it can, can happen and especially a little one two year old can yeah. that could very well absolutely happen. yeah and but if he had, the same time, you would have seen him exactly yeah you would have seen it mm. he's wearing very distinctive clothing as well yeah you exactly, know and, yeah. but no trace of him has ever been found no, nothing. Uh, and they also, again, bringing back the whole, you know, um, animal attack thing, they, they searched mm. all the dens that they could find within a certain mile radius for bobcat, right, yeah. bobcat dens and bear dens um, that they mm. searched for either, like, you know, remains, torn clothing, that kind of thing. Um, you know, didn't come up with, with anything. Um, nothing at all. And they just searched the whole, the whole area. And, uh, you know, and as you rightly say, no, um, no trace was was found. No, you know that his trail stopped at a certain point. Um, there was no clothing. You know, no toys that he may have dropped, oh. or 
you know, mm. skin, bone, DNA, like absolutely nothing. It was as though he just vanished into thin air on the spot. <clears throat> and yeah. that's where his trail kind of, you know, started and, and, and ended. And uh, yeah, it's, it's less, um, yeah, that was I really mean, technically, the... he's got like five of those points marked just on, At least, on his yeah. case. Because I suppose... Yeah. I don't know if you if you think this is correct. Now I think Politis might be doing this as well. Under six, the disability or illness, I think yeah. he might be classing the very very young ones. He under does. That, in yeah, that they're counts. not abled to the vulnerable, basically. So yeah. those that couldn't, um, like if they were snatched, they couldn't fight back or you know do anything mm. to it. So yeah, so that that point uh, about the. Uh, either having a, a disability or an illness that also does incorporate young children. Uh, mm. So, ba- you know, sort of babies and toddlers, that that kind of age, um, those that couldn't the defend themselves or, yeah, fight for themselves, that kind of thing. Yeah, the vulnerable. So, yeah, no, that does include that. So that's why they, he would tick that category. He wasn't known to have had an illness or a, a disability, but, yeah, he was of such a young age that whatever happened, yeah. he, could, he couldn't have prevented it or, or you know, mm. sort of sadly done anything uh done anything about it so yeah that's that's the first one that he that he goes into um which um yeah again he's just bizarre really yeah, um it's very bizarre i mean we we've both done because this is essentially the only real open case left out of the ones that politis goes over we did we have both done some subsequent research to kind of like as of today sort of thing to mm. to kind of see you know what the what the latest is and we have got um a bit of info but we'll we'll come back to that at the end of this section i think we'll Um, i think we'll touch on that a little bit later but because i think it's more important that we go through the other other cases cases, yeah and then we'll come back to that before we jump on to the the next ones um because yeah there's there's some discrepancies and yeah some interesting info that we've sort of found on that um so yeah, so the next one, um, <clears throat> which again is 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 you know under bizarre circumstances, takes us a little further back. Um, it's the uh, 15th of August, uh, 1958, and that happened in the Rocky Mountain National Park, um, and that happened to uh, young Bobby Bizup, who was uh, 10 years old at the time. Uh, he was at um, uh, Camp St. Mayo in Colorado. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was essentially a uh, church group um, for boys, like a, a like a boys camp, I guess. Um, originally set up by a Catholic priest um, back in the mid nineteen thirties. Mm-hmm. Um, All right. So yeah, I mean, if you're talking about a Catholic priest and a young boy going missing, you probably don't have to look too far for. Uh, he might have got moved on to another but, parish uh, or something. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> yeah, we won't dwell on that point for yeah. too long. <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> in bad episode. taste. That is. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so yeah, yeah, so Bobby was um, <clears throat> fishing in a creek, um, not that far really from the uh, the the church building where the the, the sort of the camp was. Um, a counselor approached him and called him in for dinner. Now, Bobby was partially deaf, so it was imperative that you made at least eye contact with him so he knew mm. to follow this counsellor, which which did happen. Which they were he both... had a, an hearing aid as well, didn't he? He did have that's a how, hearing aid, yeah. That's how bad it was. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Um, so the, the counsellor walked back to the church with, you know, with Bobby following him. Um, after not having, you know, kind of much interaction or anything from him for a while, the counsellor actually turned around to check on him um, and at this point, he noticed that he'd disappeared, but he had picked up his fishing rod and his belongings and started to walk back with the counsellor. Yeah. But again, so he'd acknowledge he, that he so he'd acknowledged that, ca- yeah, that he yeah, was that it was time to, to come back, back for dinner. Yeah. Um, and again, it's that point of separation. The counsellor turned around to walk back towards the, the church, turned back around to check on Bobby, and he was gone. Yeah, at some point in that, of walking forward, yeah, Bobby disappeared. Taking a few steps uh, forward, turning around, yeah. and he and he and he vanished. Again, ten um, years old though, so he's he's old enough to, yeah, be aware. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, and yeah, as you as you said, that the searches never went on went on beyond sort of ten days. Uh, this one was a nine day effort. 
um, before it was um, cancelled. And again, they searched the creek, they searched the, the grounds of the church. Um, there was a lot of, uh, again, boulder fields and uh, sort of scree fields um, and a lot of kind of high ridges around the mm. church because it was set within a, a mountain mountainous sort of landscape um that's right yeah, it was in a ravine like, wasn't it yeah pretty much yeah yeah pretty much yeah so yeah after the the nine day effort with, with of course uh, you know nothing turning up no dna no tracks no you know he didn't drop his hearing aid or his fishing rod or any any clothing uh, not nothing. a sniff not a sniff of, of uh, literally evidence. as well literally even, not even the canines couldn't yeah. get a sniff dogs couldn't find him yeah, yeah. um however uh a year later, the same search party um, returned uh, to, to, again, check the same path because obviously he was still missing at this point, um, checked the exact same ground, went to the same locations, and they unfortunately did find uh, Bobby's hearing aid, uh, clothing, and some uh, partial uh, remains. That's right, yeah. Now... That's weird in itself. The fact that those specific items or you know remains were found in locations that were categorically searched by the Absolutely. search team because it was within the vicinity of not only the creek but the the church and some of the councillors of the camp commented on the fact that you couldn't get lost. You know, as you rightly said, you know, he was a 10 year old lad. He, he, he was aware. He knew where yeah. he was. He'd been to the camp before. And if you turn on the spot and to go back to the church, I think you can effectively see it from the creek. Yeah. It's, you so just you follow the creek and you get down to yeah. the campgrounds. Yeah. So again, it, you can't not, get lost. So they were like, it, well, it wasn't that. Yeah. And it was so, it was up the mountain. Mm. It was a long distance up the mountain as well. Mm. And it, uh, an it was area a straight line, they, basically. Yeah, an area in which they had searched before. So that right there, we've, yeah, we've ticked, we've ticked eight of them there. Yeah, we've ticked eight of the criteria with that. Uh, eight so out of the eleven. So point of separation, uh, time of disappearance was middle of the, it, again in daylight. Yeah, middle of the day, yeah. Uh, boulder fields near water. Um, he had a disability and he was hearing yep. impaired. Hearing impaired. Yeah. Canines couldn't track him. No. Um, found in an area previously searched. Searched, yeah. Um, and there was missing clothing as well. There was, yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah, and he was just—it was just bizarre, you know. He, he's, you know, he's old enough. He was confident enough to go out fishing on his own. He knew where he was. He knew, you know, he knew of the mm. area. You could literally turn around on the spot, look down the path, or even look look down the creek, and you would see where you had to end up. So even if the councillor did run back to the the camp. Bobby still would have been able to, you know, get himself mm. back there. But in quite literally the blink of an eye, he he disappeared from, you know, right behind his um his you know his camp counselor. Uh, and as you say, he's slightly more than uh, Dior Junior, but he's got um yeah eight out of the eleven criteria for you know for a mysterious you know missing four on one case and. Yeah, that one in particular is just yeah, is bizarre in the circumstances. As, as people will listen, that they all are, but um, mm. yeah, it's almost like the more you go through them, the the sort of the stranger although they follow, yeah, although they follow the same criteria, they get stranger in you know yeah. in the you know in the circumstances. So um, yeah, so that was uh, yeah, that was another one. Um, this one again, a little close to home. Uh, I, know, yeah. I know it sort of got the both of us with uh, <sighs> with a couple of bits that um, that, that crops up. Um, this, uh, unfortunately, again, was a little bit um, closer in, in terms of the timeline. Um, this was on the 2nd of October, 1999, um, and it uh, occurred in the Comanche Peak Wilderness Trail. Um, and it involved young Jared Atadero, um who is only three years old yeah who's also the age of my lad now so watching it it was a bit it was a bit rough like i could yeah. feel every emotion that the dad you know sort of went through 100 um, percent. yeah yeah it's it's it's, it's a horror i mean they're, they're all horrible but the, you know there are just some that you kind of relate to or not even relate to but you know you kind of feel a little bit more 
you know sort of invested in because of certain yeah. circumstances and and this was certainly one i know for for both of us um now this again it was a weird one this uh this involved a um a, it's weird it was a christian singles group who were staying at the resort um that uh, jared's father owned and ran um mm. in the uh oh i'm gonna butcher this Poudre Poudre canyon resort or Poudre canyon resort i think it's Poudre, yeah yeah i think i've, I've butchered it either yeah. way but it was in a resort <laughs> anyway. that's all you need to know <laughs> a mountainous resort it was, <laughs> it was up in the mountains it's up in the mountains yeah basically yeah, a bit of a walk <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> um so yeah so this group was staying at the father's resort and they were going to hike up to um a trout stream now, Jared's older sister, who I think was six at the time, had already been invited by the group to go along. Um, and obviously, you know, Jared being a three-year-old lad, didn't want to, you know, get FOMO, so begged his dad to let him go along. Yeah. Now, the thing that the thing that gets that got me in sort of in you know in, in hindsight, I guess, was that the dad didn't want him to go. Of course, you know, for obvious reasons, you know, he's only he's only three. And there wasn't a there were adults there to look over him, but it wasn't like there wasn't like a relative or a friend or yeah, there was whatever no one to kind of watch really... over him. Yeah, he, he was entrusting both of his kids to just this local, you know, sort of church group. Um. So anyway, they they aim for this. Um. Gone. Yeah, I was going to say actually, um, I do. If I just don't want to correct you, but I think there was a person known to Dad that was going along on it. I think it, it was she was one of the locals. And they yeah, I think there were that people that he knew. That we were going to go. We're only going to go down the road about ten or fifteen minute walk. Yeah, um, a, a mile or two at the very most. Well, I think the group had stayed there before, so they were familiar to the yeah. dad in in that respect. But again, I, I don't That's necessarily right. know if it would be anyone. I you'd suppose want to entrust your kids with, but I suppose they're a church group. You you wouldn't. Think maybe imploring a good Christian nature. Them. I don't yeah, know. exactly. Yes. That's that's the only thing I could assume um in, mm. in that respect. Um so they, they went off on the, the hike. Um uh, Jared and his and his older sister went along with the group. Um now the, the trout stream that actually aimed for, which was unbeknown to the dad at the time, um was actually 15 miles from yeah. actually 15 miles from the resort. And so you had to obviously drive 50 miles further into the mountains to get to the start of the, the trail. Um, so that they all obviously they all get out of their cars, they start on the, the trail, which again, pretty standard country trail, really. I mean, it was, yeah, well, I mean, they say it was like um, it wasn't an easy trail for kids either, it was no. like an intermediate. If you were fit, no problem whatsoever. Yeah, but they said that kids could go up it, but you'd have to be. An adult would have to be with them all times to come Constantly, help, them, yeah. help them along the way, sort of thing, because there were, you know, a few sort of treacherous bits and, you know, and whatever. Um, but it all started off quite, quite nicely. One adult assigned herself to watching the Jared and, and the and the sister. Um, you know, probably not even a mile in. Um, Jared was sort of off in front, playing, jumping about. You know, just enjoying his time in in the wilderness. Um, the adult you know, sort of caught up with him and then subsequently surpassed him further up the trail. She was a bit of a, a speed walker from what they say. Mm -hmm. So she was sort of looking to get ahead of the, the sort of the rest of the group. Now they say that it was only for, a, you know, a few moments that she, um, that, well, they first start off by saying that it was a few moments that uh, she noticed that she hadn't sort of kept an eye on him, but then either her or, someone retelling the story i can't remember now but they said it ended up being 15 minutes before she yeah, it was 20 minutes because they they should last decided evening. to they decided to kind of sit down and have a yeah, little bit of a rest. Take a rest yeah and jared had been you know jumping about still exploring yeah. you know picking up sticks throwing them and yeah you know they're doing what kids do doing what a typical um, adult would do but it'd been 15 from, from when they stopped to rest the, the adult that had sort of assumed responsibility had noted that it'd been about a quarter of an hour before mm -hmm. she could remember last seeing him. Um, now, they assumed that he hadn't seen them stop and just took himself further up the trail, you know, sort of on his own. So their plan of action was to continue up the trail catch up with him. in the hope that they would catch up with him, um, except that, of course, 
never happened. Um, they they never they never caught up with him. Um, <clears throat> so that that's when <clears throat> excuse me he was technically last seen. Um, now they did actually have a a couple of witnesses. There were two fishermen um, on a creek um, at some point along the the trail that remembered talking to Jared and he apparently asked them about whether bears were in the area. That's right, yeah. Um, and they, I, I can't remember the, the answer they gave him to be perfectly I honest. I, I, don't I think, think, I think you'd, you'd give an answer to it, even if there were bears. You'd probably say no. You'd yeah. say, no, no, no bears you'll be all right. Here, don't yeah. worry. Just, which is weird because you also, I don't know, well, I know about you, mate, because you'd have yeah. the same sentiment as me. If you and I were out fishing in a creek and like this, this kid, Suddenly wandered up asking if there were yeah. bears near. He'll be like, "All right, you're right. Um, who are you with? Yeah, you're out here by yourself. And yeah. like, you're on well, your own, or yeah, yeah. Just wait, yeah. Tell you what, why don't you just stick with us, mate? Um, wait for your wait parents until, to catch you know, up. Or... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Know, yeah. But it, it didn't seem that didn't seem to hindsight happen. is twenty twenty, isn't it? Really? Let's yeah, be exactly. And, and um, I think with the type of community it seemed to be, the fact they're out in the wilderness, you know, you're probably you'd probably be allowed to assume that or you'd be forgiven for assuming that they just thought, oh, their parents are a bit up the trail and he's just run on ahead mm. and whatever. So, you know, thought, you know, sort of thought nothing more of it. So they had a, again, they had a pinpoint uh, of where these fishermen were. So they knew his exact kind of last seen um, location. So that's where they were obviously able to, you know, kind of start their, their search. Um, and again, search and rescue uh, professionals um, went looking straight away from the start of the trail, right up to the point that he was last seen, um, which involved 65 people specifically trained in search and rescue. Yeah. Um, is that again? Professionals, pros. Yeah, pros. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So they knew exactly what they were doing, where to look, how to look and, you know, and everything else. And um and again, there was there was absolutely no, absolutely no trace. He just he just vanished seemingly into thin air, leaving nothing behind. No tracks, no DNA, no no nothing. clothing, absolutely nothing. Like he'd literally no just sense. vanished on the spot, um, or you know, sort of been picked up into the air or something. You know, there was there was mm. just nothing. Um, you know, but again, searches you know sort of continued along the trail, uh, the creek. Um, right up into the you know the kind of the wilderness um and, and this one went on for three and a half years um with just nothing found no evidence no nothing. no trace no eyewitnesses no sightings absolutely nothing um and but it was actually two professional hikers um that were scrambling up a scree field um now this thing from the from the point of the trail <clears throat> to the top of this scree field, which basically just a boulder field, like a like, like a landslide sort of thing, mm. um, it was five hundred ninety four feet elevation, and these guys were professional hikers and they struggled. Um, mm. You know, they had the the, walk, the the climbing sticks and the boots, the gear and, and, and everything. They were they were seasoned professionals, especially in this particular area. Um, and so this was some three and a half years later. They were hiking up this uh, scree field and came upon a trainer mm. that was in pristine condition like like it had just been dropped there the, i think one of the cool. hikers actually said he was expecting to see the rest of the kid attached to the trainer it, it yeah. was that new and that unspoiled um but it was wasn't it was just the little little trainer kind of stuffed behind a, a rock up this up this uh, scree field um now I think one of the the older hiker I think said that he'd heard the story of Jared Atadero and as soon as he saw the trainer he just thought that that that's his trainer that's got to be it, that, yeah. that's him we've you know we finally found something so obviously they called it in and, and they reported it and uh, again search and rescue professionals went back out there covered the exact same um, ground that they did before and um, yeah this one was a little bit little bit more sort of gruesome but they found a tooth his skull cap and his clothing um yeah. neatly neatly arranged 
on top of a log. Yeah. So it was though so it, w- it wasn't like it was in the midst of a, an attack or they'd been dropped by something. They they'd been placed there. Yeah. Purposely. Uh, and in the documentary, it has a it actually has a picture of the log. It does. In yeah. which Where you can see was. you can see yeah. his cranium. Yeah. And the tooth. Yeah. Just sitting popped there. right next to it. Yeah. Um, the odd thing as well was that even though they found the the, the trainers, they found the jacket. Yeah. They also found these um, his trousers, trousers yeah. inside out. Yeah, inside out. Perfectly inside weird. out. The people got concerned when they found the trousers because, despite the fact they were inside out, but they were missing. I mean, I think the the left leg I think might have been missing. From the trousers, yeah, and then there were little, it, it? and then there were little sort of like potholes taken out of the rest of it. Mm. Now, a lot of the locals wanted to believe that that was where they believe that's where a bobcat basically ripped his leg off in in the attack. But mm. the dad and other professionals, i.e., like wilderness, you know, hikers and stuff, uh, professionals, they believed that it was actually local wildlife picking up the material. To use, to use for uh, nests because they've seen it hanging from trees sort of around the you know sort of surrounding area so that that's mm. kind of where he was able yeah, to, to give you an idea as to what the material is it's like a, it's like a pair of jogging bottoms yeah that's you know, right those yeah. little yeah. little elastic jogging jogging bottoms that are elastic around the waist and elastic around, around the, the ankles. ankles yeah little so, and they found hair. this yeah they found this blue material all over the place all over yeah. the area in nests where animals had taken it and... for nesting yeah, so they didn't believe. So that was one thing that kind of convinced them that it wasn't um, an animal attack. But the, that the and the thing, lack of blood, the as lack well. of blood. Um, there, there weren't any remains, or uh, sorry, there wasn't any blood or DNA on the clothing. Hmm. It was yeah, so aside it from like it was a mountain lion, wasn't it? That's what they were yeah. attributing it to. And then they said, well. If there was, if it was a mountain lion attack, Where's the there would be the some animal? CDNA, there would be hair yeah. samples on the clothing because it gets woven in. But it was nothing. There's nothing. Spotless. Aside from, obviously, you know, wear and tear of supposedly being out in the wilderness, so, you know, dirt and, you know, just looking a bit kind of grubby. Mm. There, there was nothing, as you said, there was no blood, there's no DNA, there's no animal hair, absolutely nothing to suggest any kind of foul play really on on yeah. on, the, on the part of either a human or an animal um and the weird thing i think for us i think for everyone that's seen it was that his little jogging bottoms were turned inside out yeah so firstly why would they be turned inside out why would they be taken off you know in you know in the first instance his trainer um again the the, the, the hikers found um was in almost box fresh condition now when you consider yeah. it, it was meant to have been in the wilderness for nearly four years for almost four years uh, and, the, and a good point actually that the dad come up with which and again which is another reason why he didn't believe it was a mountain lion attack was that he, he was like you know if if he'd been if the mountain lion had dragged jared up the scree field to where his remains were found which was again some almost 600 feet in elevation um you know where were the scuff marks on the trainers why yeah. why were they in pristine condition yeah and the, so, the thing is his Just dad nothing. had had all of that. He had the he had the trainers. He had the jacket. He had the, the trousers, all still in the plastic bags, like the evidence, the evidence bags. bags. Yeah, um, kept he's it. got his son's cranium and his tooth as well, which is yeah heartbreaking. It's harrowing. It killed, it, it killed me when he took it out of. Uh, it almost looked like a call bag that he took all the stuff out of. Yeah, and he and he held the evidence bag with his essentially his son's cranium in it, and he said he said he gets me every time. He said I can't believe I'm standing here talking to you. Holding my holding son. Holding my son. And it's just like the only thing he's got left of him is Jesus. a tooth. The top part of his skull and a, and a tooth. And it's just... And no answers. And no, no answers. Closure. No, because no the, official, the official conclusion from the local law enforcement um, was that there there wasn't isn't a conclusion. They couldn't pinpoint yeah. it to anything. They couldn't say that it was a an abduction, an animal attack, you know, just a freak accident. That Because there, there's just no traceable evidence aside from where he was last seen and his remains some 594 feet up a scree field and they spoke to yeah. the two hikers and they said look in your experience do you think a two-year-old boy could climb up that you know unaided despite knowing what gear you have to take um and it was funny like the older one just straight away was like nah 
no, no chance. Absolutely no. no way. The other guy you could see was trying to be a bit more kind of like, well, I mean, I guess if he did this, and the guy cut him off and was like, no. <laughs> it's just straight up ridiculous. No. The kid would not get up that, you know, unaided. Um, and again, not without being, you know, without someone hearing him fall or scream or cry or calling exactly, out for someone yeah. that he'd got lost or because he wasn't with his dad. His sister had obviously walked off or stayed with the group. So he knew he was on his own. You know, he didn't mm. call out for anyone. People were calling for him. He, you know, he didn't respond. Like obviously, when they, this was obviously after he disappeared and they were searching for him. So again, it's just yeah. a lot of, you know, it's a lot of factors that just didn't. Well, yeah, just didn't add he up. ticks nine of the boxes. He does. Yeah, he does. Jared, Jared Adero, he, he ticks nine of the boxes. There's yeah. a point of separation, time of disappearance, broad daylight again. It's a boulder field, literally the other side of the creek, or a scree field, as they're calling it. There's a creek, so it's right near water. He's vulnerable. The canines couldn't track where he went up until that point, again, right up to the creek, could not trace yeah. him after that. Again, found him previously searched areas missing clothes and an yep. unknown cause of death yeah so almost it's, a full house and potentially it could be 10 with geographical clustering yes. so the only thing that would you know not be like the royal flush with this would be the yeah. weather event the weather event because there wasn't i mean that it there was a weather event but it was after the it was after well the after event. so it's when he's um yes i think it was the day's that followed the search that they had, they suffered heavy snowfall, which covered, mm. w which would have covered a lot of evidence or tracks and whatnot anyway, but obviously substantial searches had been carried out by, uh, which you know, that, by, that, by I mean, this point anyway. This one's so, so strange because of the, the items that were found and the condition and where of the yeah, items. Condition and where they were found based on his last The disappearance is, is odd enough, but it's that part of it, yeah. which it, it, it happens so much more regularly than what you might think as well. Oh, it's actually a big deal in, in the States, but they don't seem to have a, a grasp on it. Um, no. yeah, the it the be, park uh, authorities certainly don't. They, they certainly don't. No, they've washed their hands uh, of it almost, and it's too much manpower and too much money to club together to you know sort this kind of thing out. Uh, not that it would necessarily stop the disappearances, but at least you'd have some sort of track of where they happened, who it involved and, and that kind of thing. Cause it's only really Polidus and maybe local law enforcement that have got some sort of clustering idea on, on where, where yeah. these people have gone missing and whatever, you know, if they didn't keep this sort of evidence, then, you know, you'd well, be on the way. It seems up. like there's 59 clusters in total in the North American continent. In North America. Yeah. Alone. Yeah. You know, <laughs> which is 59 of them across that landmass. Yeah. And, there's some that, well the biggest one that they've got there is yosemite national park with over 50 people over 50, going missing yeah. under these 11 criteria yeah so there's there's plenty more people that have gone missing that yeah. uh, there's been evidence of animal attacks or criminal activity yeah. those four factors that, that we said, said earlier would, yeah would cancel it all mm. but there's over 50 just in yosemite national park yes in the rockies right. Which is just just nuts, astonishing. really. Yeah, it's nuts. Um, and yeah, and obviously, yeah, again, talking about another national park. Um, I guess the the next one um, that we can uh, we can go into um, involved uh, a young Samuel Belkey um, on the sixth of October, uh, two thousand six. So you know, again, that little bit uh, that little bit closer. Um, he was eight years old, um, and this took place in the Crater Lake National Park. Um, again, he was driving through the uh, the trail uh, with his dad. Um, they stopped to get out, take a look at the view, which, to be fair, is an astonishing view. Um, Samuel crosses the road um, and starts to run up what is, you know, a very small scree field in comparison to a lot of the others that we've you know discussed he gets to the top and you know he's been a bit boisterous you know being a bit of a lad and he uh, a cyclist is passing along the road at the bottom now the cyclist believed that samuel was had picked up a rock and was looking like he was going to throw it 
at the cyclist. So the cyclist stopped and, you know, sort of said something to him, probably along the lines of, don't throw that. <laughs> Wait, pack um, it in, you little bugger. <laughs> yeah, to, um, to it. And then the cyclist, you know, carried on, um, to which Samuel panicked and um, basically ran down the other side of this scree field, which is leading down the other side of, like, I guess the hill or the, the, the field, mm. leading down into kind of dense woodland now, the very much, area yeah the dad was only on the road so he really when you again when you watch the documentary it really wasn't that far so <sighs> so for the dad to get from the road to the top of the scree field it would have been what, seconds, seconds 30 seconds at the very most i would i would have said um if he if he ran but by the time the dad got to the the top of the the field um mm. samuel was gone again no 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 tracks no he didn't drop anything he, he didn't fall down he did, there was again absolutely nothing he just vanished seemingly into um you know into into thin air um now that again <clears throat> the one thing to mention which is also one of the 11 criteria um is that samuel had autism mm -hmm. so you know again he had a, a sort of a, a I don't disability, know, disability really, or you know an illness yeah. or whatever which which was kind of one of the you know criteria that he, he was near certainly a, makes him vulnerable that's for sure certainly does um you know he was that's why they thought that he was gonna well they didn't know whether it was just him being boisterous or whether it was part of his autism that he was gonna firstly throw the the rock at the the cyclist but then mm. also how he reacted to the cyclist presumably telling oh. him to not throw it he just kind of dropped it and ran well from an autistic child's point of view it's uh, how they react to certain things it, it makes sense that he would bolt it you know yeah. it's it's one of those things that they can't they don't understand social cues and you know they don't understand yeah. that in this instance it's not okay to throw a rock at someone yeah you know it that's that's yeah. not cool and then when they get caught up like get caught and you know words are uh, are exchanged they don't know how to cope with it so they bolt yeah exactly um, you know i've i've got personal like first hand um experience of stuff like that where yeah. i have seen a kid you know he was quite severely autistic um i remember it was when i was living in london and right. uh, it was the old oyster card thing oh, okay and he was, looks like he was out with his nan and uh all three of us were at the bus stop and I allowed them to get on first. And the boy, the lad, he wanted to pre he wanted to give the put the card on on the reader so it'd make the the particular noise. Oh, okay. So he knew that if he did that, if he put this card on that thing, it would make a noise. Excellent thumbs up. We're all having a good day. Yeah. That's the way that they think. But Nan, for some reason, decided that she was going to do it. And then he got a bit upset and said that he wanted to do it. So she allowed him to do it. It then made the wrong noise and he just bolted. He jumped off the bus and he legged it. He must have been about 11 or 12. Right. And he just he just lost it because mm. it had made the wrong noise. Yeah. It turns out that he, you know, he was severely autistic, but it's that seems to be a regular yeah, exactly. uh, pattern, yeah, a common pattern of theme behavior. Sort of thing. Yeah. And yeah. is, it would be it would be correct to to suggest that autism is in some way a disability for a lot of people as well. Yeah, and and to sort of, I guess, to lend itself to you know to the the criteria, it, it does fit what Pelidis reckons is mm -hmm. one of the 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 sort of the the vulnerable. Well, he ticks he ticks seven of those boxes. He does. Belkey. Yeah. You know, he's, he's, I suppose we don't need to keep going over them, but if no. anyone is keeping keeping track of what yeah. the criteria is, you'll know that he'll be ticking all, like seven of them. Seven out of the he's... 11. So, yeah. Um, yeah, and I think this was really, I think it was the Belkey one that I, from what I can remember, that really highlighted the fact that the National Park Service do not keep a record of, of missing persons because uh, an ex-detective had sort of heard the story and knew the area, so wanted to sort of get involved, try to pull up that information to see whether there are any common occurrences or trends or anything like that, to only be told that that information didn't exist. And so, and this was, like I said, only going back to 2006, so I think it was this one that really kind of highlighted the, uh, 
sort of the the issue. It's like a stop right there, sunshine. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, exactly. Well, yeah, that was only three years before uh, Pilatus was approached by the park ranger. Yeah, exactly. Yes, it still would have been fairly fresh at the time. If there was like inner circles and and whatnot of park rangers talking about these things. Yeah. Because that does happen. Yeah. You know, they do talk amongst themselves. They do have community amongst themselves. Yeah. Um, They know that they're not really supposed to talk outside of their community and outside their workplace. Sure, they probably do. Yeah. Because it's not just the disappearances, it's other weird goings on and and sightings and and things that they all said to experience. But this was the what this was the main one that you know that kind of you know affected them all. And uh, like uh, the Orkun says, nothing found, no trace at all. He's absolutely nothing. No remains, nothing. No, the only. Th- the, I mean, and again, the the kind of the the, the sort of the weak uh, kind of conclusion was that he he fell down. You know, the other side when he he ran away, his, his you know body was was hidden by you know the, the, the sort of the, the undergrowth. undergrowth and all that. Because the following day they were expecting a large uh, storm, and I think twelve, I think it was like twelve to twenty-four inches of snow fell within well, a, within a day. That's right. I forgot about that. Yeah. So you so, could probably say rather than seven, you could say it's eight then, because that's a weather. Right? <clears throat> yeah. So they were saying that he was probably his body was probably lost under the snow um, the day after he sort of disappeared. So it would have made it even more impossible for the searchers to, uh, crazy, you know, to, to to find him. Um, so, uh, yeah, but again, you know, within seconds of, of, of sort of, you know, running off, he, he was, he was gone. And again, no DNA, no tracks, no, no, no trace, didn't drop anything, just absolutely no evidence as though he'd sort of turned around, ran and then vanished gone into, into, into thin air. So it's, yeah, again, it's, um, yeah, it's an, it's another, another weird one really. Mm. Um, there is there is one though there is a going to kind of finish this little section on a bit of a high note a slightly happier note yeah for the most yeah. part yeah because sometimes they do get found they do get found absolutely yeah no they which do which is very very nice and uh take it away you've got this yeah? one okay yeah so this was uh again quite some time back uh, it was the 10th of April 1952 in uh, Ritter Oregon uh, and he, he involved a Keith Parkins, who at the time was only two years old, and he was in, if I remember rightly, his, his family had just welcomed some new lambs onto their uh, family farm, and so him That's and his right, yeah. him and his siblings were out in the barn where the lambs were to to sort of look at them. The mother called them in for tea. Two of them returned, um, but Keith didn't. And the mother said, well, where's where's Keith? And one of the siblings said, oh, he's just running round the back. So the mother went round the back of the barn to to catch up with him, um, only to find that he wasn't there. Uh, and again, you know, you look looking at the documentary, they give you like an aerial shot of the, the farmland and it was completely open space. So yeah. if he ran off in any direction, it didn't really matter how far you would have seen him. Mm. Um, and he again, he was uh, he was a toddler. Was he was like two years old? Two, wasn't he? Yeah, he was Is two. that right? Yeah, he was yeah. two. Yeah. So uh, again, so yes, yeah, so that's one of the. Um, he's not going to be moving fast. One of the criteria. Yeah, he's not going to be moving fast. And if he does, he's probably going to run for a bit, fall down, get back up, run again. You know. So and and, mm. and again, around the barn and the farmhouse, it was just completely open fields and you know and kind of wilderness. <laughs> um, but again, he just disappeared into literally into thin air because he, his mother couldn't see him and again there wouldn't have been enough time between her asking where he was to get into the barn for him to have gone anywhere other than hiding in the barn um and again you know searchers um searchers went out scoured the the whole the whole field and, and surrounding land and uh he was he was found um they found uh, they they had to travel three miles <clears throat> from the barn before they found his footsteps uh, uh, footprints. Sorry, in the in the in the ground again. It had been snowing, so if he was going to have walked anywhere, you would be able to follow exactly where he'd been in the snow. But the weird thing was, they had to travel three miles before they first found a set uh, yeah. of footprints, which is in itself just 
bizarre. Like, how could you just not leave Incredible. and suddenly they pop up? He um, didn't sprout wings or anything like that, you know? He's, it, yeah, exactly. How does, yeah. That how does that happen? Exactly, yeah. Which was just weird in itself. But then five miles on from that, um, his uh, his little body was found uh, face down in the uh, in the snow. Mm. And uh, luckily, his dad was only about 100 yards behind the searcher who actually uh, found him. So they were able to you know, obviously get him and you know, get him to sort of help or whatever. Um, but yeah, the, the cool thing was that uh, Keith was actually in the documentary uh, yeah. at the time, which a couple of years ago, um, a 65 year old man. Um, yeah. But interestingly, couldn't remember a single thing about it. He, he just recalls people coming up to him in later life being like, oh, I was, I was out searching for you when you went missing and kind of people telling him the story because he just had no, no, no recollection rec- of recollection. it they, they, again, they tried to blame, <coughs> excuse me, they tried to blame um, uh, an animal um, sort of attack mm. to explain how he'd covered so much ground at the age of two. Um, and, and also when they found him, they found him with uh, scratch marks on his face. Yeah. But he remembers, and this is only because someone told him, but apparently at the time when someone questioned him, he said that their pet cat had scratched him like the day before That's he right. went missing or something. So that kind of poo-pooed over, you know, over over that uh, theory. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I guess... Well, they, they tried to attribute the, the scratches on his face from um, the, traversing the, the, the barbed wire fence, didn't they? Because they, they had a barbed wire fence well. that surrounded yeah. their property. Yeah, and, exactly. And the, the land included as well. And he would have had to have climbed under it or through it to get to where they found him. Uh, yeah. Because there was a few snags on his clothing, and so they yeah tried to say that it was just where he'd climbed through the the barbed wire. But um, how? But this is the thing: how did he get to that point? How unnoticed, did he get unnoticed, unnoticed and with leaving no, no tracks? Yeah, yeah. You can't do that. It's, it's literally just, like but, he'd been picked up from behind his barn, carried three miles, and then just dropped, dropped. into a into a, a spot like air teleported or something yeah. like that. It's just. It's just yeah, incredible. It's, it's bizarre, but um, but yeah, but that, that's a slot of the, the sort of a happier, I guess, of the, mm. the stories that they actually yeah. go over in the the first documentary because not only was he found, but he was still alive to you know sort of to the I say to this day, but to the the point of recording the uh, documentary yeah, to not actually necessarily to be able to tell the tale, but no, but to certainly, certainly... give some sort of uh, well, because he showed the clothes he, his mum had kept all the clothes that he'd worn on that day. That's so in the right. Documentary, yeah. He sits there and actually says, "Right, well, this was like the hat I was wearing. This was my jumper. And you can see where I caught it on the barbed wire, and you know, whatever. And he, I think the shoes that he had on, I think he had as mm. well. Like his mum had kept all of it, which was, um, you know, which was quite a cool little it's incredible uh, keepsake. But um, yeah, that's, yeah, that's interesting. interesting as well. That one does that does tick a lot of boxes. Um, you it, know, does. Got... it does. It um, does. And also, canines couldn't trace him until. No. They found those footprints until they found the footprints three miles <laughs> away. The, yeah, three miles away. And then that's, they could. That's the thing that I can't get out of my head on that one. Yeah, that's the thing. It's like he was literally picked up, carried three miles, and then dropped at that point where his track started. And then he walked, you know, five miles further. On I his, mean, on some of the, the explan- explanations about that have been quite ridiculous. Like a large eagle picked him up. Yes, <laughs> you know, a large yeah. eagle picked him up, and carried him three miles, and then either dropped him or set him down, or like, set him down, or something. Yeah, you just think. I mean, there are. I mean, a bald eagle. I think they, they said a bald, they a bald all... eagle can carry up to thirty pounds or something. Yeah, and, yeah, and he, he weighed quite that was he it? weighed twenty three to twenty five pounds. So they said the law, you know, sort of the law of physics or whatever that that could have happened. But they um, they believe it to be very uh, very unlikely, wow. um, you know, in the uh, in the circumstances. Oh, absolutely. But, um, but no, I thought that was uh, yeah, certainly to end this section on that was one of the more uh, the, the, well, certainly the more positive one because it actually had a oh. conclusion, and not only that, but the conclusion was positive in the fact that little Keith was actually still alive and lived yeah. to 
live to tell the tale or you know re re recount other people's oh, yeah. versions of it <laughs> certainly <laughs> that, that much you could remember but that's interesting though. again he's got lack of memory of all of it yeah you know because he's he, he got um he suffered from like minor frostbite as well as the scratches on his face as well yeah. what with being face down in the snow yeah exactly um, yeah but yeah i mean it's it's good to hear that maybe there's one or two in there that, that are actually do yeah. find them yeah and at least they can come back you know yeah. there's the, the documentaries tend to exactly yeah. still strange i mean the do documentaries they tend to explore the ones in which people haven't come back yeah but there are an, there are quite a number of them where mm. children and adults just come walking straight back out of the forest it's and like they're like, happened, yeah. i have no idea what's just what happened. are you talking about yeah yeah. Like, like I said, it, um, last episode or the episode before, the geezer came yeah. out and he grown a beard. Yeah, in the episode ten, you said yeah, 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 it was for the fairies, wasn't it? He'd only been gone, <clears throat> excuse me, twenty to thirty minutes, but he came out with a, a fully, fully grown beard that he didn't have mm. when he walked in there. <laughs> but it'd been like eight days. Yeah, eight days had like gone that. past, yeah. and like he had no idea. For him, he'd just been like, oh, I just caught on the trail and he came Got off the trail, and... gone back on yeah. and come wandering out the forest and suddenly yeah, it's like, been missing yeah. for eight days declared, Where declared have you been? dead yeah. you know it's just yeah. But, but yeah so those do happen those do crop up in the missing four one ones as well which no, it does if you are going to take something from that it's a happier story because they've come back yeah exactly yeah um and i guess Still the other lack thing of closure though of those isn't it it is in terms of how you know how he got there and and you know kind of essentially what happened to young Jared Atadero in the in the previous one that we went through um, mm -hmm. because uh, I know we spoke about him before um, but there's quite a well known um, uh, Canadian guy by the name of Les Stroud um, yes. which I'm sure some of our listeners may have heard of but he's basically like the Canadian sort of Bear Grylls. Um, just less of a fraud. Oh, you, yeah, you mean the legit, <laughs> the legit, the legit version, of, version Bear of Bear Grylls. Yeah. You know, they don't stay in, in hotels or anything like that. Yeah. Nah, Les Stroud, he is legit. He's man. legit He's, survival and expert. He, yeah, he found that route that that Keith Parkins did. He read, two he walked it. He walked it. He yeah. walked it, and he said this was difficult. As a full grown for man, me, as a, yeah. yeah, as a full grown man, like mm. if I had. Like moderate experience, and with his gear this would be on. very difficult. Yeah, yeah, exactly. He's he had carrying the pack boot, and he had walking boots on, and all the you know the gear and whatever. And he said, "I've struggled to get to this point, and that was I in think, the time frame that was given." Yeah, exactly. Well. The same the time thing. frame. Yeah, and because I think he'd got to the perimeter fence with the barbed wire, um, and he said, "This is where you know little Keith would have crawled through and snagged some of his clothing or whatever." He said. I've struggled to get to this in the, the time frame given. He said, I've got to walk another five miles yet before he was actually found. So yeah. it was like Harry got from that point to that point in the time that he did. And there's he no way of really not... telling how long he'd been face down in the snow as well. Well, so, exactly, yeah. Again, no real way of telling him yeah. how long it taken him to get from that fence in which he snagged his, his clothes on to being face down five miles yeah. away. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Um, it, I just know that in this time... Possible. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, I, I don't know how those sort of things happen. No, um, exactly. And um, yeah, and that's just the, uh, yeah, it's just the weirdness of it. And and that's, you know, hope, hopefully we've we've sort of put that across, you know, the with how weird and unexplained and mm -hmm. almost impossible, you know, these cases are, you know, there's, there's no reason for them disappearing. There's no conclusion as to where they went, what happened to them, what, you know, why it mm -hmm. happened. You know, not even traces of other people being involved. So you could put it down to a kidnapping or an abduction, or it is, it is quite literally as though they vanished in thin air in front of. Uh, and that's the thing that absolutely. these were kids; they were with people, ex except for. Uh, Albeit they are the vulnerable but, ones with regards to the missing four on one. They are the more vulnerable ones that what that are yes. more likely to have gone missing because their ages or. Or this but there've been, but there've been people present. Yes, it's in broad daylight. Yeah. yeah, they're gone. It's yeah. just, yeah, it's it's just it's, it's mad. It's it's mad. It's, yeah. a, it's every parent's worst nightmare. It really is. And oh, it is. Yeah, at least it, if you uh, had some sort of closure, 
in terms of like this is what happened the you know we found you know sort of remains you'd still be absolutely beside yourself and distraught but at least you could have some sort of closure as to yeah now we know what happened but to you know to a lot of these well i mean to all of them really even to keith even though he survived him and his parents will never know what happened on that day how he got mm. there why he walked off why he you know disappeared you know, we've and you know, like with Jared, how any and of it Dior, how yeah. you know, why did any of them disappear? Jared, that one, that one really people. got me. It's at the toward the end of the dock, and his dad had never gone to that point where they found the remains. No, but he decided no, to go the up there. Yeah, he decided to go up there with the documentary crew, and yeah, it was. He actually said it, he he'd never been, he'd never seen the trail um, covered in snow. That's and when right. he when he goes back with the documentary team, it has it snowed quite heavily. Um, and he and so he, yeah, he, he basically retraces um, Jared's. Um, I mean, death, he's really the mentality of that man. He's he's such a strong person because the oh, what, yeah. what absolutely killed me was when yeah. he I got to the say. spot where they found his his son's remains, yeah. and he said, "If this is where my Jared died, then boy, you found an incredible spot to hang out." Yeah, and just like oh. oh. Fuck! Oh, oh I'm, not I'm not crying. You're right. I'm not crying. You're crying. Like, yeah, not ashamed to say it, man. I had tears. I really did. Even thinking about it now gives me gives me a lump in my throat because yeah. it just hits so Jesus. close to home. Yeah, and God, because God. You, like him, you just think that these kids are just like they're so vulnerable. There's no yeah. way if 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 something had taken them, mm. there's no way that they could fight it off. No, exactly. Yeah. And that's, that's why, that's one of the criteria as we've, you know, as, as we've gone over and that's what they believe links all these people is that, that those that disappear are vulnerable either by age or uh, mentality or, or, you know, disability, however you want to kind of look at it. Uh, and that's what they think is a key indicator of why these people go missing, almost why they're, you know, I don't know, preyed upon or, or, or what you know yeah the predator attitude sort yeah. of thing maybe but pick off the weak there are, as it were there are those that aren't that weak and they go missing as well no absolutely and, yeah and that's what Paul uh, Politis actually explores in his second documentary about the missing 411 that's right the hunted now this is where he goes into various different hunters that have yes. that have gone missing um and the the one that we'll talk about first is um, a, a, a Thomas Messick of is uh, of the the sprightly age of eighty two. Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah. He this happened in Albany, New York, in yep. two thousand and fifteen. Right. Yeah. Now, give a little bit of background on Thomas is that he had been hunting and fishing his entire life, and that was yeah. very much a family activity that that everyone got involved with. He oh, was yeah. a huge part of the community as well in, in Albany. You know, he had taught yeah. hunting and trailing to pretty much all the local kids. Pretty much everyone in the in the town, yeah. Mm. And he was, he was quite, it was, it was just in his blood to do that as well. He, it turns out yeah. he was an airborne ranger in the army. In he was, yeah. Um, he was, yeah. He had an immense amount of experience in trekking, trailing, yeah. hunting, being out there in the wilderness. Absolutely. He was... Well, out of his 82 years, I think over 50 of those had been in these woodlands or in yes. and around the Albany area. And I know we spoke um, before recording, but I likened him to essentially the closest thing to like John Rambo, I think that you yeah. uh, you could probably get in terms of his like knowledge and experience. And, you know, I mean, even... He had the war and, wounds to, to yeah, prove it as I was well, didn't say, he? Yeah, I was going to say, he lost an eye to a, a gunpowder... Um, explosion didn't he yeah he lost his eye he had uh, 159 stitches in his hand yeah. so he'd done some serious damage <laughs> yeah. to his hand as yeah. well um and he, he used to use it as like a, a a teaching method to the kids it's like that i'm very experienced and but i had a lapse of attention yeah. Yeah. and this happened to me don't let yeah. it happen to you you know and yeah. you need to pay attention this is what happens when you don't well, that's the thing, so, that, as you said, he taught hunting, fishing, hiking, and general survival skills to not only his three or four uh, sons, but also to the, the community. Um, yeah, and very much loved in that community yeah. as well. Which makes you this know, even stranger. <laughs> yes, absolutely. It really does. So yeah. 
he was of an age of 82, so he's getting on in the, in the years. He's in his, uh, I guess you could call it. He's uh, prime. Yeah, your dusk years, maybe. <laughs> yeah. And uh, he was sight impaired and he was also a little bit deaf as well, his son said. So he right. was, he didn't do too well. He could hear, but it mm. wasn't great. Yeah. It's important to note as well, he was not a drinker. No. And he never drank on a hunt. So no. if, if they it, went it on a hunt, they might world. have, they might have like a beer around the campfire at the end of the day, but that's yeah. it, a beer. No he's, drinking whatsoever. His best friend that he, that he always hunted with said they always kept a, a beer each in the truck for when they returned right, Sid. after the hunt Sid yeah mm. when they returned to the truck after the hunt so they mm. could crack open a beer and sort of celebrate the day or you know celebrate the hunt if they got a, a, a deer or a buck which is what they always got without foul so yeah that's why but yeah he never drank before they were prolific hunters they were very oh, very yeah. good at what they did <clears throat> and despite his age and being like the the sight issues the hearing issues he still had all his faculties he was still all the ticket. Oh, yeah, he, was, he was still oh, yeah. very much there. He knew the rules of the hunt. Yeah. He knew exactly what needed to be done. So this yeah. particular trip in which he went missing um, happened around a, on, on Lily Pond Road. Yeah. And it was uh, near the Lily Pond Lake um, in New York. Now, Lily Pond Road is two miles of uneven dirt road. It takes 12 minutes to travel down. So from the main road yeah. right the way down to the pond, yeah. which is where they do the little camp, 12 yeah. minutes to drive. Yeah. Now, this was only supposed to be a quick hunt and only supposed to last for two hours. There's a, um, what they call a watch and drive sort yeah, of hunt. Right. Now, to, there was a total of seven hunters. Four of them um, were the old boys. Yeah. They were the, the granddads and the, the, the veterans. The veterans, veterans of yeah. the hunt. <laughs> and they were designated as the watchers. That's right. So, that was Tom, Joe, Sid, and Al. Mm. And what that consisted of was them going up, walking back up uh, Lily Pond Road at 30 to 40 yard increments. Yeah. And then they decided, then they turn to the right and walk into the tree line and they sit down. So they find a tree stump yeah. and they sit themselves down. They rest their, <clears throat> their bones. They rest and their again, that was, only, that was only another 40 yards inland. Exactly. From, from yeah. where, yeah, from, as you say, from where they, so off, they just off of the, the Lily Pond Road, yeah. another 30 or 40 yards into the tree line. And their job was to watch for deer. So that's right. The yeah, other. So, sorry, I think I was just going to say what you're about to go into. <laughs> yeah. So the, the younger lads, they continued along the, the trail, which took them right. southeast and then a, a 90 degree turn, which then took them back up the hill, in which again they walked at about 30 to 40 yard increments from each other yeah. and their job was to drive the deer, the deer down towards the down watchers. toward the watchers and the yeah. watchers were there to take the shots yeah everyone wear, was wearing high vis yeah such um bright um yeah. bright clothing to you know so there's yeah. no accidents or anything yeah. like that. now the the point of the watchers is they do not move no. and you do not leave Elidus the asks yeah asks Tom's wife if he was a watcher would he have moved she was like no he knows the rules you, if you're a watcher you do not move he you would stay not in that position yeah. that's your that's your post yeah and being a military man as well you know you don't leave your post it's all about honor yeah he, he wouldn't absolutely have, he wouldn't have moved yeah now, Tom was wearing a red plaid cap um a camo jacket duck boots um he carried a walkie-talkie as well he knew how to they use all, it they all had them yeah um, he had a rifle with three or four, three to four rounds, and he also had a snack. Yeah, now, I think he also did. He, am I right in saying he also had a bow and arrow with him? No, no, he didn't. Not this particular not hunt. This one, right? Okay. No, I think he's. Um, I think he's his son who was on the hunt mm. with him. Yeah. He may have had a bow and arrow. Oh, okay, right. But Tom certainly had a rifle. Just a rifle, yeah. Okay. Um, so they do the drive. They they come across no wildlife whatsoever no right. birds no deer no rabbits nothing no is driven toward them <laughs> nothing yeah, yeah no crickets <laughs> yeah. nothing at all so That's they right. decide to they decide to go back to the the trucks so it's it, they've sat there now for two hours yeah. they're thinking that's enough now let's head back they all called it out on the walkie-talkie um then only six of them come back to the trucks yeah they realize that tom hasn't tom mm. hasn't come back yet so they call on the radio and there's no reply whatsoever. No. 
um, they fire off the three shots. Yeah. For and that is for anyone that doesn't know, if you fire off three shots, that's a distress signal. Distress signal. And it's, yeah, I'm lost. Yeah. I'm lost. Or I'm in or danger it's, or something. It's yeah. a, you need to come this direction because yeah. if you hear one shot. You know that that's about the second shot allows you a chance to discern where it's coming from. The third shot is the confirmation of, of where, where that yeah. shot is coming from. So, yeah, if Tom was about, he would have he would have heard these three shots and he would have been able to go right. Okay, I know where I need to I, go. I need to head in that direction. Yeah, I need to go down to Lily Pond. But again, where the, <clears throat> where the know, trucks he's, were. he's a experienced hiker. He's a military man. You know, he only had to walk forty yards away from where he was stationed to get back onto the road and then there's only one or two ways he had to walk to yeah. either get to the main road or back to his camp so he get back onto yeah. lily, lily pond road and turn left that's all he had to do <laughs> exactly yeah and like i said he had all of his fa faculties he was yeah. he wasn't senile he wasn't he losing daft. his grip yeah. or anything like that yeah he weren't daft he wasn't daft no so there's no sign of tom there's nothing anywhere he's There's not responded no to the wall key and he hasn't responded to the three shots um, that's right the, the group fired off which is and unusual on both counts absolutely yeah and it, this is so far outside of his character that mm. there's there's been no trace of the man there's, even no. to this day so this happened in 2015 this there's even to this day they you know his son still goes out there because they're local to the area still yeah yeah they still go out there and there's still nothing I there's think. no well, I think you know, at the um, point of the documentary, it had been three years since Tom's disappearance. And at that point, mm -hmm. uh, they still hadn't found Tom or, you know, any of his belongings. They didn't find the rifle, the, the jacket. They didn't find any any of the snacks that he had. Absolutely and there was a nothing. lot of people out there as well. Like, <laughs> um, that, that Because he was such an integral part of the community, everyone got involved. There's 300 people on the ground in that area. And yeah. they did... Um, they did a cross section sort of thing where they set up a piece, uh, set up string string lines in which yeah. they go right. Okay, we all search down this area. We set a string line. We move over to the next area to the right. We set another string line. We search that area. Yeah. Um. They even. But they went uh, they top say, to like, bottom. It looks like it, they said it looked right. like a spider's web out there. Yeah. That there was so much string that they scoured yeah. that area with a fine tooth. Fine every thing. inch, every nook and cranny Nothing. was. Uh, was was scoured and he even lily pond itself um had divers out there scouring that's it, right looking for him in case he had fallen in or something and, what was interesting nothing. in this in the documentary is what sid had to say now well yeah hmm. <laughs> indirectly yeah yeah it, well, yeah indirectly yeah, yeah. It, it was <laughs> through sid jr um yeah. or sid the third so i think something like old that, boy yeah. sid is actually sid the sid junior really yeah. i think that's what he is yeah um which is a, a common thing out there out mm. in america but they they name senior junior the next generation after the previous second and third yeah yeah so um so sid was probably about 80 yards away from where tom would have been positioned so yeah. sid was also one of the watchers yeah and he said that he heard a very strange sound in the forest that he'd never heard heard of before and it came from yeah. 150 yards away to the direct front of him, which would have taken that sound up the hill. So where, where the guys were, yeah. Where the drivers were. Yeah. So But he didn't he didn't he was couldn't seem to he... explain the sound, could he? It's like he I just it's just I don't know. He said I don't know how to explain yeah. it. It's just something I've never heard of. Before. I don't know if it was because he couldn't explain it or if he didn't want to because he did look quite uneasy yeah. when he did Pledis was quizzing him on it <clears throat> to say well what noise was it can you can you replicate it can you describe it you know had like, you no, heard it before just and he was like, heard of before can't tell you what it was but in all my years out there i'd never heard a sound like mm -hmm. it and it was his son or pres <laughs> presumably Sid's his son. son yeah Sid, Sid the third um yeah. he he said yeah the, but my dad, he, he spoke to me about it, you know, closer to when it all happened. He said it sounded like a trap door slamming shut. Mm. Yeah, now, that, that's, you like that's weird. And why why, why mean, would you hear that in the middle of the woods? Bear in mind, there's no wildlife. There's no ambient noise. There's no birds tweeting. There's no deer. There's no, 
you know, elk. There's nothing. No, no crickets, nothing. It's completely silent, devoid of any life other than the seven guys that were out mm. there, you know, hunting. And the, and the one thing that he heard was that. And the only thing that he could attribute it to was like a, a wooden uh, trap door. A wooden trap door shut. slamming shut. And he said that happened about an hour into the hunt. So yeah. it was still an hour before they everyone got called up. on the yeah. walkie talkies and they wrapped up and met back at the trucks. Yeah. And that's when they discovered that Tom was no longer around. So could you have disappeared far earlier into the hunt than what they maybe mm. anticipated, assuming that noise has got anything to do with it? Mm. Well, this is also something that happens with that one as well, is that it's a little bit strange because this lot, they don't get involved in missing people, but the FBI turned up. Yeah. Two, two agents two from men the FBI in turned suits. up. <laughs> mm. They turned up and uh, started asking questions. Now, they interviewed Tom's wife. No one else but Tom's wife. Just the wife, yeah. And they, she said they, they didn't have much to say to her or even much to question her on. But they did say that something's not right with this. Um, but don't worry. Uh, but no, that what they said was something's not right, but won't know until he is found. So that's the strange thing is that they've just said he's now declared as a missing person and something strange is happening here, but we won't know exactly what it is until, until we find found. him. Yeah. And as you said at the start of that, the FBI don't have jurisdiction in uh, missing people um, cases. Mm. Um, so it's very odd that old Mulder and Scully turned up. Yeah, exactly. In the middle of the, in the middle of, uh, the search. rural North, New York that you know they're in the middle of the search to say to you know mrs yeah. messick your husband is now declared as a missing person and we won't know what's happened here it's very until strange we, until we find him but it is odd yeah mm. didn't question anyone else didn't offer up any any help because they they Polidis interviewed the lead investigator at the time and he said did, did did the fbi tell you why they were there and he was like no i didn't have any um interaction with them but they weren't here for long and all I, all I know is that they they spoke to Tom's wife yeah. so even the lead investigator from the uh, presumably the Albany Sheriff's Department or whatever um, yeah whatever county it is I can't yeah think, can't remember had, what it was had no interaction with the FBI who saw it necessary for them to arrive yeah. Be, and, and be I on don't, site almost. certainly don't think that they were men in black either because there was no threats or anything like that. No. There was no caginess about them no. other than they didn't really say much. They didn't ask much. They were just there. The only thing... The Sounds only way, more like yeah, men in black, uh, FBI even. Yeah, I mean, they, they confirmed it as such, but the, the only way you would maybe let your mind wander into that side of things is because they turned up sort of unexpected they had no reason to be there they were quite mm. odd in their interaction with the investigation only to sort of confirm what they did to tom's wife decided that they were they weren't needed or there was no reason for them to continue their investigation and they they left which was which is, is kind of odd in itself they, they had no reason to be there yet they didn't yeah. offer any help or anything either um because the, the lead investigator the lead detective did say that he thought that they were there to offer up their knowledge and experience in in these types of cases but they did none of that so that's that's maybe the only way you could possibly let your mind wander crazy, into it? maybe it being a little bit more than yeah than what it actually um you know than what it actually was <clears throat> um but yeah, yeah so, which was which was, which was you know, very bizarre. very odd i mean that's that's in, that's a very bizarre case um yeah. and that that comes from new york state so yeah i'm going to talk about three more here mm. that are part of the cluster now this is yes. the santa fe cluster yeah um right. santa fe down in new mexico yeah and what i'll do i'll i'll start off with a gentleman called uh, stanley vigil Yep. And uh, this this happened in the Santa Fe National Forest, yep. um, which is a cluster of forest that has like five separate parts, but it covers mm. something like 1.6 million acres of something, forest. Something it's stupid, yeah. Incredible, actually yeah, incredible ridiculous. size. Now, he was over at uh, uh, Barillas Peak, 
That's with right. uh, his father and a friend and they were driving down the dirt roads mm. and they were looking for deer yeah. um, and a deer crossed their path up ahead yeah. so stanley being the hunter that he is he jumped out um out of the the truck and chased it yeah. So took took off in the same direction that this deer did. Yeah. And almost with his rifle, obviously. With his rifle in hand, with intention in of hand. going after it, yeah. Absolutely. He won't, yeah. Yeah, he won't get, he's not gonna tackle it down to the ground, I think. <laughs> get it in a headlock or yeah, wrestle, <laughs> yeah. wrestle it, yeah. Like something like out of uh, me, myself and Irene. Yeah. He finds the cow <laughs> yeah, exactly. and it's like yeah, that's that's trying to put it into a sleeper hole. <laughs> yeah. Um, but what's really, really weird, now this is the first one that we're going to talk about in a really adverse weather event, is it instantly, as soon as he went into the forest in that direction, fog and heavy rain set in from that direction almost instantly. Almost as soon as he left the truck and ran in that direction, the fog descended and it started to rain. Just, yeah. yeah, Almost instantaneous. Instantly. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so he disappears. Um, cut a long story short, they search for seven days. No right. sign of him whatsoever. Canines couldn't pick up his scent. Uh, helicopters, helicopters were called. They couldn't find any trace of him whatsoever. Professional trackers found nothing. Um, but five months later, yeah. five months later, they um, it was an off-duty officer mm. and his son were fishing at Pecos River and they find a body. Yeah. Um, now... With this, they were able to discern that it was Stanley's body it was. that they found. Right. And he had suffered some skull injuries and had some broken ribs. Yeah. But the coroner had, um, had discerned that his probable cause of death was drowning. Yeah. Now, obviously, five months later, there's not going to be much left of him. Mm. But then if he's found in the river, he's going to have water in the lungs and everything else. So... But wasn't Logically, he... it makes sense that they would attribute drowning yeah. to him. Well, and the odd thing as well, as you say, this so this occurred early November 2017, and it That's was right, early yeah. early April 2018 that his body was uh, found. But he was some nine miles from where he jumped out of the car, directly south, directly as well. south of of the lake. And I mean, like literally directly yeah, south, as the bird flies, sort of thing. It was bang on nine miles in a straight line from where he jumped out of the, mm -hmm. the car and in the direction of where the deer was going there was no reason for him to have gone that far that far That's down right. towards the creek because he would have caught up with it long before mm -hmm. getting anywhere near that sort of distance he was an experienced you know well, hunter. I mean, um, you you you're a runner mate you know how yeah. to run those sort of distances and everything mm. on pavement yeah, you're, exactly. uh, you're not going to be running up and down yeah. fucking you know cross-country yeah. terrain and, and such nine miles of woodland yeah. in the fog you know you know that's going to take i mean even the fittest person that you know you're looking at over an hour to like cover to that Be i'd like to see bear grills so, tackle that that's for sure yeah, exactly yeah <laughs> after is that before or after he gets into his five-star hotel well he's got to have his coffee first isn't he yeah he's got to have his massage first and he i suppose yeah <laughs> yeah that's the one um yeah. but what the, the, and i don't i'm sure you you'll sort of correct me if, 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 if i'm wrong but wasn't he wasn't his body found naked in the in the river that's right it was yeah i guess so, he had missing clothing as well missing clothing his rifle Makes wasn't no with sense. him he was just stark bollock naked in in this creek with mm. with broken bones with head injuries yeah no mi missing clothes his rifle wasn't with him but yeah, there's he, no way of actually tracking him to that point because the dogs no. had not Picked up a scent. Didn't pick up a no scent. Yeah. Professional trackers are bearing in mind professional trackers would have seen the point of entry into the forest. Yeah, and, and, and that's when they would it. have gone, right, yeah. that's where he's gone. We need we know we need to go in that direction. Yeah. They go in that direction, they find nothing, nothing at all. Not a, no, no, nothing. As you say, it was about five about five months, wasn't it? Five five months from when he mm. sort of disappeared. And yeah, it was yeah, nine miles later they found his his body in a in a in a creek or in a river yeah. like you say stark bollock naked stark bollock naked when he left the jeep fully clothed with the intention of hunting deer so what yeah. the hell happened for him to lose all of his clothing and his rifle and well, wind up isn't... dead with broken bones this so... is the odd one as well because it's not the only one that was in this cluster that no. was found under the same sort of conditions 
So no, exactly. this next yeah. this next story, um, this next case, sorry, not stories. Yeah. This next case, case follows yeah. uh, Audrey Kaplan. Yeah, that's now right. Audrey was um, at seventy five years old, but she was a sprightly seventy five. She was, she was like fit, yeah. Yeah, she was like yeah. she'd often done these mountain trails with her yeah. husband quite often. That's right. Um, now this happened in July of twenty fourteen. Now she and her husband had gone up this particular trail. Um, a trail that they'd done many times before and yeah. it was headed toward the ski resort and they were on the hunt for mushrooms man they were they were They were on the hunt yeah. for mushrooms maybe that was her maybe that was her secret maybe it was yeah who she knows? finds those magic mushrooms man she'll live yeah. forever that's it. <laughs> you know? yeah, that's it yeah i reckon that's what it was <laughs> yeah um the, i mean she was known for being in particularly good shape for her age as well and yeah. point at which they get to towards the peak um of this particular area mm. um, well, she was separated the from of, of the the actual peak itself yeah and interestingly i've not made um i've not made a note i did have it but of, i can't of it either. The only, find the thing <clears throat> the only thing i've noted is that um yeah that she disappeared when she was separated from her husband because she went off the beaten track to look in a particular patch for, for sort of for mushrooms That's right. on, yeah. on their way to the main part of the, the, the sort and again, of it's one of those points of separation in which he yeah. turned his back, turned back around. She was gone. She wasn't in gone. the place that she said she was going to be. Yeah. It was just gone. Yeah. She, he was ahead of her on the track and that's he was, what's important. Yeah. This is what's important to, to, to note as well. So again, th- heavy, heavy thunderstorms, occurred yeah directly after the disappearance yeah as well um now at the fifth day of the search yeah a hiker came to a creek that was a uh, little over three miles north of the point of separation yeah so this would have meant that when she disappeared she was actually south of her husband yeah but they found this person found um, further ahead. Actually, we found a camp area that was seemingly just completely sort destroyed. Of yeah, and camping, was, camping equipment sort of strewn all over the place. All like, over the place. Say, it looked like it had been sort of ransacked. And now, wrecked. this is the interesting thing: is that it doesn't say that she went up there with camping gear. No, I don't think she went up there in camping gear. No, she went up there looking for mushrooms. She's not going no. up there to camp. No, she's not hunting or anything. Not hunting mushrooms, but you know, <laughs> yeah, 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 but. So this is also the, the strange thing as well. So this person thought it was very odd, took some various different pictures of it. Yeah. A little further way up the creek, um, he came across the remains of a woman completely naked in the fetal position in about four or five inches of water. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't even remains because if you think it was only five days, uh, three three or five days into the... Sorry, set, yeah, not remains. It, would, it was just her body. body. It was just her body. But again, yeah. she was completely naked. Uh, in the as you say in the fetal position and they measured that it was only five inches of uh water yeah so again at, at the very most now yeah. her face was in the creek she was in the creek yeah. in the water she was. yeah she was. um but this is what what was interesting with this particular one and Politis pulls this up as well was the coroner's report and i'll read out a couple of quotes here from the report mm. so Although there are no specific autopsy findings to indicate hypothermia, the circumstances of Miss Kaplan's death and lack of fatal disease at autopsy support cold exposure due to very low temperatures at night. Yeah. Now, got to bear in mind as well, this is July in New Mexico. In New Mexico, yeah. It's at the height of their summer. It's going to be a bit toasty up there. It's be very toasty. And I'm, I get it, you know, the arid conditions you know if there's it's really hot at night there's no cloud cover in the yeah. heat when it gets to night time um it go it does go cold because yeah. there's we have such things does, as there's yeah. frost in the desert and such because <clears throat> there's no Watch cloud the cover day, there's no way of keeping night. the yeah. heat in yeah exactly yeah but also there was no injuries that caused or contributed to death no and this is this is the odd thing as well. This is really weird that the coroner put this in the report. Mm. This last quote, given that there is no report of the um, decedent's face being in the water when found, 
nor circumstances documented to support that it had been in the water, mm. it is unlikely that drowning played a role. Now, yeah. clearly, the crime scene investigation photos show, show her she was in a creek in yeah. the water, face in the water. Actually as well. show the, they actually show the photos that the hiker took when, when mm. he or she found Audrey. Although they blur her out, although you can see it's a woman in respect. Feet, it's a body in the fetal position. But yeah, they, they blur it out of respect. But yeah, you can clearly see that he's standing on the bank of the creek and she's very much not submerged, but she's very much in the water, albeit five inches. But yeah, that's the thing. It was it he's like but they put it down to the cause of death being hypothermia, but then as, as you read out in that report. They said that there's actually no evidence to suggest that she suffered from no, hypothermia. No, no physical, no, no no physical evidence of it. Yeah, Clearly no they didn't find water in the lungs, so she didn't die no. drowning. No, exactly. Yeah, there was no bloating or anything. So, she, yeah, there wasn't anything There's nothing. like that. Yeah, and so, <clears throat> you could be forgiven for thinking that, you know, maybe, you know, she'd found the mushrooms. She got she got off a, off a bounce on, on mushrooms add a bit of an episode or a started, started dancing and, with Sasquatch. Exactly, yeah. Had a had a slow dance with a big man and ended up drowning in the uh drowning in the creek. But they'd only st- they'd only just started their hike from the ski resort at this point. Mm. So there's no and again there was no toxicology or anything to suggest that she had been inebriated no. in any way. Um but also and that this is again I don't know why we have well we should really keep keep mentioning it. Canines could not trace her they could not track no, her see, it, it took a it took a uh just a, i don't think they're even a searcher no it's just, just a hiker it. it was just a hiker three days later that that, that found uh, her in, in yeah five, weird, five days into the, into five, the search, sorry yes yeah. in, in so they were only a couple maybe two or three days of calling off the formal search and just so happened someone stumbled it's, across her well and it was only because he found the camp and as you mm. say, he found the camp. He see, he'd seen that it had been ransacked and whatever. So he he took you know sort of pictures in case it could you know sort of lean, lead to anything. And it was only then when he turned towards the creek that he saw Audrey Audrey mm. there. But again, why was she you know naked? Why was she in a camp that she wasn't there to camp? You know no. why? She was just there on a on a small <coughs> trail to go and get some yeah. go and get some shrooms, shrooms man, shrooms, and then man. head back home. Yeah, exactly. Probably, get, so, probably looking to get high as fuck. Probably off her, <laughs> off her tits or mushrooms. Yeah, <laughs> yeah worst thing to do so, when you're seventy-five. Well, there, exactly. Yeah, and again, as you say, she was she was sprightly. She was you know she was young for her age in terms of her you know physical fitness and stuff. So there was no reason for her to have been to have wound up in in that um, you know in that uh, in that in situation. That condition, really, it's, just, um, it's yeah. shocking. It really is. Um, but the third one that I'll talk about with regards to this Santa Fe um, cluster, yeah. is a Melvin Nadell, a 61-year-old yes. gentleman, yeah. who went missing on Elk Mountain. Yeah. Now... it's about That's about 60 miles from where Stanley went missing. That's right. In, uh, so this is why it's, it's important yeah. that they have these clusters that yeah. are technically... They're just unexplained. So yeah. what happened with Melvin is that he arrived at the campsite um, at 4 p.m., and joined two work buds um, who had already set up camp. Yeah. Now, he had, uh, Melvin had actually had a, a, a slight knee injury. Um, he'd stepped in a gopher hole a couple of days before <laughs> yeah. and, and done, done his <laughs> knee. Yeah. Um, but so he decided that, like, look, I'm not going to go off hiking with you boys. I'm just going to stick close to the I'm camp. Gonna stick yeah. close to camp because it turns Elk Mountain is called that for a reason. There's yeah. elk everywhere everywhere um, yeah and i mean even just like they're just wandering about they're just yeah. plentiful they are there all everywhere well, it's like in london isn't it? they say you're never like two meters away from a, a rat you know yeah. in, in elk mountain you can't turn around without seeing one <laughs> yeah without seeing a bloody elk <laughs> and a bloody big and all <laughs> yeah, like, yeah ain't that they're right. enormous yeah sod trying to take tackle one of them jesus yeah. christ sod that, yeah. so um yeah, so he's got this injury and he's decided yeah. that, no, I'm not going to go on the walk with you two boys. You go off, you go do your hike. I'm going to stay close. Yeah. Um, so he decided to actually, um, a little bit further down the trail. He about 100 yards, to, wasn't it? About 100 yeah, yards from um, the camp. Yeah, that? about 150 yards it was. Yeah. And he decided to set up a blind. Yeah. So anyone that's not in the know, uh, a blind is like a little 
set up that you create so that you are blind to whatever it is you're you're it's like a canopy almost you you sort of build it up with twigs and trees and whatever to camouflage and you sit and wait yeah and you sit and wait and which is which goes to show you how many elk there is about that if you sit and wait long enough you're going to find one they'll come to you yeah absolutely so which also it it sounds like that was a bit of his character as well because his wife his wife is a character his wife (laughs) his wife was a character she really was um she's like she's just she was just straight straight laced these are the answers no we don't know anything about his disappearance we don't know where he went um he didn't like to walk yeah he was like just straight up didn't like to walk he wouldn't have walked with them he wouldn't walk far yeah and um, he wouldn't have stalked an elk or anything like that. he would well, just play this says to her didn't he asks her would he have walked off would he have walked th- down the trail would you know would you have gone in in search of the the elk or whatever and and she just she basically just yeah as you say looked him de- dead in the eye and was like no he didn't like no. to walk he, he wouldn't he didn't like to walk he wouldn't have moved <laughs> yeah yeah so yeah. you couple that with uh like not wanting to walk and with an, an injury he's certainly setting up a blind he's to that's what he's going to be doing yeah exactly so the the other two eventually come back and night has fallen at this yeah. point. So they're set off um, and they were going to be doing an evening hunt. So yeah. probably they're set off, let's say, between half four and five. Yeah, it was a few. And, we, we, we didn't get an exact time in the documentary. They just say that no. a few hours had passed. Um, the, the other, as you say, the other two returned to the, the camp. They returned back from their hike and they found and that Mel's there. Jeep was still there, but Mel yeah. was gone. Wasn't, yeah. No sign of him whatsoever. Yeah. Now, this was the, the, the strange thing is that Mel's Jeep was still there and it contained, it had his container of water, um, it had his food and it had his GPS in there. Yeah. Now, logically, I understand why he wouldn't have had his GPS on him because he wasn't, he was planning on staying near the camp. He's 100 yards from the car. Why would he need it? He knew that he just had He's to turn ex- around and walk back. I know he didn't like yeah. walking, but you certainly wouldn't be calling in your GPS to get a flight over to your camp 100 yards away. Yeah, exactly. You know, yeah. It's, it's, he was an experienced hunter. He knew exactly what he was doing. He knew the area incredibly well. He'd been hunting mm. there for years. He didn't need his GPS to go 100, 150 yards away from camp. No, he didn't. Um, no. Now, eventually, um, another hunter actually came by who had a, a satellite phone. Mm. Um, so that the other two hunters that Mel had gone out there with had called in search and rescue. That's so right. He's gone missing. He's not responding to to the three shot rule. There's nothing. He's he's not about. Yeah. So the New New Mexico State Police oversaw the search, which included dozens of ground searchers, two helicopters, and multiple dog teams. Yeah. Now Mel was carrying a bow with bolts. And a firearm as well. Yeah. Um, and that was, uh, according to his wife, that was something that whenever he went for a hunt, he always had his sidearm. Yeah. He always had a firearm, a pistol there, ready to go, just in case it went down with a predator, yeah. which you or, have to do. It makes sense. Or if, or if it wasn't for that, or, then the, it was for the, the three, three shots. shots. Yeah. Absolutely. But there was no trace of him found past his blind. So no. the dogs were able to track him from his from his jeep to, to the, the blind. blind yeah and that's, but it. that's it again yeah. nothing and his, his bow wasn't there the sidearm wasn't there he wasn't there was no dna yeah. no clothes no tracks nothing that so was like he'd walked down to the blind and then just vanished just absolutely straight up vanished um it's incredible i don't know how how that even happens um <laughs> so the formal search only lasted six days that's um right, yeah. it didn't last for particularly long no, um, but I think that one... was more to do with Melvin's character because they knew that he, he was injured anyway. He didn't like to walk, and being an experienced hunter, he went. He chose his his path. He made mm. his blind, and that is where he should have been. He wouldn't have wandered yeah. off track because he didn't have a, a need to. If he, and if he had a blind there, he knew it was because elk were going to be in front of him. So yeah, and it wasn't a predator that got him. He was no. too big for a mountain lion to get. Yeah. Because mountain lions don't attack adults, not not regularly. No. Um, I think you you found the figure, didn't you? It was like, the figure, it was like yeah, fourteen it was, um, of them since nineteen fifteen. Is that right? 
Yeah, full, uh, since 1915 in the US and Canada, there are only 14 reported uh, mountain lion kills. So, oh, kills, but, not attacks. Sorry, yeah. Yeah, so, so yeah, so, so fatalities. And, you, and you'd expect that if, they, if they're going to go to the extent of attacking a human, then it is going to be a fatality because they're... Yeah. They're hunting for food as well, I suppose. So Absolutely. I think that just gives you an but, idea on how remote. It certainly it wasn't a bear. I mean, I know they do have bears in New Mexico. Yeah. And it certainly wasn't a bear down to the way in which bears kill. Uh, well, His quite frankly, they don't, been there. Yeah. they don't kill. They, they just more. start eating yeah. you. Yeah. That's just like, and like on the spot, they're not good. They're not dragging you away. They're not like wolves or cats yeah. or anything like that. That like to eat like, private. When we say there's no tracks, there's no animal tracks either. There's, no. there's there's his footprints up to the blind, and then that's it. There's there's nothing, no footprints coming in, going out. It's as though he walked to that spot mm. and then got airlifted out of there, sort of thing like that. That's it, because that's where it just ends, you know, inexplicably. Really, and there's one guy on there, Bob King, who says what we're all thinking by this point in in the documentary. <laughs> yeah. If you haven't he got says there it already, kind of candidly, yeah. he says it kind yeah. of like jokingly, but I think. I don't know. He believes he, it a little bit, you can tell, but yeah, and, and in all honesty, mate, I think I kind of believe it a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not exactly. Lie. Yeah, but he goes, uh, this Bob King, so he's quite an, an important member of this community. He's the owner of the Santa Fe Guiding Company. Hmm. Now he's been doing, he's been out in the wilderness for well over fifty years. He's fifty-three years old at the point of recording, and he said, "I've spent all my life out in these." hills these are mountains it's this is part of me i know this area mm. um and when he's asked that like what he thought could have happened to mel he said well here in new mexico roswell alien abduction <laughs> and laughs yeah um but then he goes i like, he goes back a bit more serious like no well in all seriousness he must have got a ride out yeah he, he got must have... out of there yeah he must have done. There is no way he, would not he find has something. gone down to that blind and just the only way that it could have happened is if he got into a vehicle and off he went. But again, no tracks. No yeah. tracks of vehicles going down to the blind. But not even tracks the tracks. The there was no disturbed, you know, mud. You know, the, the foundations weren't disturbed. There was no snapped branches to indicate that he might have gone a certain way. It was literally no, only, the, only the snapped branches blind. for his blind. For that the blind, was it. yeah. And that was, That's it, and that was it. But yeah, he says it sort of a bit tongue in cheek, doesn't he? Mm. Uh, he, he? He does say that, like, uh, if, if he wasn't actually a hiking person, then to be honest, he probably could be anywhere out there. Yeah. But the fact that Mel really wasn't a hiking person, yeah. he didn't want to. He didn't like walking. He didn't want to walk. He had an yeah. injury. He wasn't walking anywhere. And he said it. It would be. It would be a great effort to find someone out there if they were lost, and they yeah. were a hiking person. They were just hiking yeah. in a certain direction. But he said, just the way with what we know of Mel, it just it's just not going to happen. It just didn't. It's just another one that you know just didn't. Yeah, just didn't add up. Um, his, yeah, his weapon wasn't found. No tracks were found. He wasn't found. And again, and again, they they had ground teams. They had helicopters. They had dog teams searching for six days. So um, yeah, it's it's just another in the long list of yeah sort of inexplainable disappearances, really. This particular story is, we're going to go into a bit of detail with this one because you're able to actually trace this person's movements and wow. they are inexplicable, aren't they? It's, they are, it's, it's incredible. Weird. Yeah. Now, this follows the disappearance of Aaron Hedges, a 38 year old man yeah. um, from Montana. Yeah. And this happened in September 2014. That's right. Now, this was in the crazy mountains. Yeah. They call it the crazies. Now, this is, I thought, is interesting. They call it the crazies because the locals believe it's cursed. It was cursed by the Crow Indians who had to leave the reservation. When they, and they cursed the band, yeah. they said, we were, the, 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 the wind is going to howl, the mountains are going to move, and it's going to drive the white man crazy. Yeah. And you know what? If, with what all the, the Europeans did over there. Fair play to them. Yeah, they're allowed. They're allowed to put a curse on the <laughs> yeah. land if they really want yeah. to. <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> exactly. But all joking aside, though, he Aaron had gone up there um, elk hunting with two friends, and they've gone up there proper wild west sort of style. They've gone up there with two horses and a mule. 
Now, yeah. they'd loaded all their gear onto the horses and the mule, and uh, mm. they left the parking area and went for this week-long hunting trip um, to right. an area called Campfire Lake. Yep. Now, on the way to the camp, the mule started bucking and throwing gear off on the, off of the trail. Got freaked out, and, didn't it? Yeah. yeah, it turns out that, unfortunately, it was Aaron's gear that was actually on the mule, um, and he lost a bit of his equipment. The majority um, of it, yeah. Yeah, they definitely they know that he definitely lost his sleeping bag, that's for sure. Yeah. So they started, um, they eventually got to Campfire Lake and they decided they were going to start hunting from Cape from that base camp. And two days into the hunt, um, and Aaron had decided to go to a cache that had been left um a couple of <coughs> he buried it a previous. few miles up, hadn't he? Now this is the thing. This is how often this man's up there. He's up there every other week. He was up there every other weekend hiking. So he knew it like the back of his if hand. He, if he's got a cache up there yeah. of supplies and, and such, then they're up there regularly. Yeah. You know, that's what that means. This is this is how he's in that area so often. He knows it like the back of his hand. Yeah. So um basically what it meant was he had to walk, follow the trail um down the creek. And this is the thing about the crazies. Sorry, I'll, I'll interject like a little bit here, digress a little bit. But this is the thing about the crazies. If you follow a creek, you're coming out to civilization. Yeah. This is how you can't get lost in the crazies. Yeah. They might have this incredible name, but you cannot get lost. You just follow that creek and you'll come to civilization. Mm. Now, this to get to the cachet, it meant going following this creek to a certain point and then making a sharp left, almost turning back on yourself to walk back up a ravine to where the cache is. Now, he'd been gone for pretty much most of the day at this point, and they tried to reach him on the walkie-talkies. So again, they got the right equipment because they're up there yep. regularly. Yep, they've absolutely. got some proper equipment with this as well because it's got an LED screen that actually comes up with the coordinates as to where that person is. Yeah. And vice versa, so they can see where you are. Almost like a live and- tracker, yeah. Yeah, yeah, sort of thing. And it's a brilliant piece of equipment. Yeah. But when when they tried to get hold of him on on the on this walkie-talkie, the GPS was showing that he was actually further up, further down the creek, um, and had actually missed the turn off to go to, to the cache. To come back to yeah. Yeah. Well, so was actually, I think it was actually on his way back when so he had reached the cache and it was on his descent down the down the ravine. To come back to his two mates at Camp Fire, where well, it was no, called. no, he, what it he was was turned left, didn't he? But he turned right instead. He, well, he just carried on, vice versa. Yeah, yeah, he just carried on. But so yeah. instead of taking that sharp right, that uh, sharp left, sorry, yeah, to come back toward the cache because it was almost like he had to take that left and come back on himself a little bit. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, he just carried on. It's like he yeah. just missed that turning. Yeah. And now there was no at this point. There was no adverse weather conditions or anything it was it was dry it was warm um it was like they were hitting like the the 50s and the 60s mm. in temperature fahrenheit so to us um yeah. they do use celsius we're probably looking at like 10 12 degrees you know mm. like a british summer yeah you know <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. and so there was no adverse conditions he should not have missed this trail and mm watching the documentary they actually take a helicopter through that area and you see the trail you can see the point at which he should have turned turned, onto the cache but two days later they had all they decided right okay this is odd now that he hasn't come back this isn't right two days later a huge snowstorm fell in and it fell thick there was 18 to 24 inches that had fallen within 12 hours so an adverse Pretty bad, yeah. weather event there. Well, because one of them that had said that his disappearance. Even I think so. He said even if it had snowed at the time he disappeared, hmm. it, he still shouldn't have got lost because after a while he would have seen that the creek was flowing down the mountain, so he would have known that he was walking in the wrong direction and that he would just have to turn around and walk back on himself. Absolutely. So he, even the, Absolutely. the snow wouldn't have. Uh, you know sort of sent him on the wrong you know the wrong path there would have been other things that he could have used to get oh, is that the bearings. point it was at the point where they were using the um, walkie-talkies and they saw his gps 
Um, yeah, they got cordless. a signal bounce back, didn't they? Yeah, and at that point there was no snow on the ground, so and yeah. he had already gone past mm. the the turning for for the cachet. Now, by this point, the the two hunters had actually got out, and they just they have declared it to the local authorities that Aaron's missing. We we don't know where he's gone. He's 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 gone missing at this point. And unfortunately, it means that they were actually in Sweetgrass County when they reported it missing. And the point at which they were when he went missing was actually in Park County. So two counties, this is what's important here to, to, to know, two counties were searching for this man. Mm. Now, um, Park County is where Campfire Lake is. So their base camp is in uh, Park County. So the, their side of the search started from that direction, heading down the creek toward where the GPS pinged. Yeah. Sweetgrass County, which is where the GPS pinged, they decided that they were coming up the creek. So they had gone from the point of, of entry, coming up the creek, almost like um, the, the, the sheriff describes it as a military pinching manoeuvre. Yeah. So they, they're either side, they're coming meeting in the middle, sort of thing. Meeting in the middle. Yeah. Oh, hang on a second. Yeah. No Aaron. There's yeah. nothing. But what was interesting is when the, the snowstorm hit, the temperatures dropped to minus six and minus nine Celsius, which is incredibly cold. Yeah. And when they were taking part in this in this the search and rescue, Sweetgrass County, which were going in they were basically going the opposite direction to where Aaron was seemingly going. Yeah. At no point did they find any tracks in the snow leading out or down yeah. to down the creek. And there was still six to eight inches of snow there. Yeah. So even though it started, temperatures started to rise, snow was to melt. There was no tracks, nothing no. at all. No trace of what, um, of what direction it'd gone in. Yeah. Absolutely. So as they were combing the area, there was um, a dog unit dog team that was coming from the north bringing it south toward the toward the creek um, a little bit further along from where the gps had a little bit further down the creek yeah. to where the gps was first pinged yeah. now this dog unit found a pair of boots purposefully placed on a bench on the trail that was just by the uh, the falls in the creek yeah so this was a high pot, high ridge that Top was of the north of the creek. Yeah. And it was like, um, the way they describe it is the bench is kind of like, um, it's kind of sheltered by the trees. Yeah. So it's almost like a, like like a, a viewing vista. spot. Yeah. Yeah. This, yeah. Yeah. That's vista. Right, yeah. 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 Um, they found his, his boots, his boots placed purposefully on the bench. Next themselves. to each other. Yeah. Yeah. And um, the way it's described, it's like a, um, a beer garden bench. So not yeah. like a, a single seater, it's a beer garden yeah. bench. Like and they're placed bench. on top. Yeah. That's it, picnic bench, sorry. Yeah. Um, and along with that, there was water bladder yeah. as well with, with his boots. And a little bit further away from the bench was a fire pit. That's right. Now, in the fire pit, they found um they found uh two of the waist belts from the His hiking backpack. bag, yeah. Yeah, they found that and the partially burnt cigarette container that was mm. Aaron's brand. Yeah. So Aaron, 100% traceable, he was there at that point. Why he was there? Yeah. No idea. Or his stuff was there. He might not have been, but his stuff was. <laughs> we, yes, <laughs> absolutely. But I mean, if, if his cigarettes are there, or he's, yeah, he's you know, them. partially burnt, Chucked yeah. it in the fire. I don't know. It's that just seems very, yeah. very strange. It's weird that he would have been there because he was so far away from where he had to be, and he knew mm. that he would have been too far down the the creek even before so he now, got to the ridge line. So, at this point, there is a lot of evidence to suggest that hypothermia is set in because yeah. he's removed his clothes, he's removed items of, of clothing that is important to his survival, and he started um, a fire as well. Yeah. And he's, he's off. You know, he's, he's no longer at that, that location. So yeah. they're starting to think that, okay, hypothermia's taken him. It's gone. We need to find him. So the whole area was searched thoroughly. 
a day or two before this as well. Mm. This is what's important. So before this point, that area was completely combed. That same bench had been seen. That same fire pit had been seen. There was nothing in the fire pit. There was nothing on the bench. Nothing, no. A day or two prior to it being found. Yeah. So what the hell was that about? Yeah. Now, dogs couldn't track his scent from there. So they know that he was there, yeah. but they couldn't track his scent as to where he'd gone from that point onwards. Now, there were 60 ground searchers, 20 canine teams, and two helicopters. Again, if you watch the documentary, you see the way the helicopter goes down that path yeah. and follows his path. And there is no way that he would have been hidden. He was wearing... You know, he's wearing his hunter's high vis and, and, and yeah. such. It just wouldn't have happened. But this is the thing. The, 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 the formal search eventually got called off. But that's not where it ends. No. This is where it does get even it's stranger. It's even weirder, yeah. Yeah. Nine months later, mm. on the uh, Ryan farm, so a little bit further along the ways, they were outside doing routine uh, fence repairs, work. yeah, yeah, yeah. yearly, yearly fence repairs and such. And um, they came across an orange high vis along with a backpack, bow, gun, and a snack inside the bag, mm. um, placed against a tree. Now, wasn't his hunting license in the bag as well? His so hunting they, license was in the bag as well. They knew it belonged to Aaron Hedges, yeah, because the, the yeah, I think it was his um, I can't remember what the, the gentleman's name is, uh, Ryan's his last Summit Ryan, yeah. He, he was his father-in-law that yeah. found it and gone, oh, is there a hunter gone missing recently? He was like, yeah. So, Actually, yeah. Oh, he's even got his uh, he's got his license, uh, Aaron Hedges. He was like, well, yeah, I know that name. That's the guy, yeah. He's been missing. He went missing yeah. like nine months ago. Um, yeah. And he was like, yeah, I knew that name straight away because there were helicopters going up and down here. He's mm. like right on the edge of the crazies. He knows oh, yeah, he, what's he knows happened it. in that yeah. area. Well, because it was him yeah. that made the comment. It was Ryan, wasn't it, who made the comment of no matter where you are in the crazies, as long as you follow a creek down downhill or downstream, you're coming to civilization at some yeah, point. You're getting yeah. out. You're, get, you're going to see someone. Yeah. And this was, so they found this, uh, the high vis, the backpack, the bow at the gun. Yeah. Um, north food, east of yeah. where... Yeah, they found it north. Uh, yeah, and the, yeah, there were snacks. There was nutrition yeah. inside the bag as well. And they found this northeast from where the boots were found. Yeah. So that's, again, so he has travelled further then, seemingly. Yeah. He's travelled further out of the crazies and within viewing distance of the, Ryan, of the Ryan's farm. So That's right. But it's not like he was, the backpack was found and it was just like, taken off the off shoulders and it dropped to the ground they were placed against the tree placed yeah propped this up is purposeful against the placement tree. again what's purposeful the boots? placement again what is this why would the boots be left on a on top of a bench though and if they were throw, taken off and thrown they'd have been strewn across the the landscape but the fact that they were mm. placed strategically next to each other obviously upright you know the, the bag was propped up against the tree the, mm. the bow was next to it the gun was next to it everything the contents were still in the bag the high vis was laid laid out across the floor like yeah, it, yeah but, but, but they were placed there if they were taken off and just thrown you wouldn't expect it to have been done so precisely no it, it just doesn't add up but again <laughs> to sound like qvc <laughs> but wait there's more um a year later so yeah. now we're looking at August 2016. On Sweetgrass Ranch, uh, there were some dudes. There was a dude ranch, and there were dudes riding up the trail. Um, when one of them goes, that looks like a human skull over there. Mm. And it was a human skull sitting underneath a dead tree. Yeah. And the way that the sheriff um, describes it, he says, pretty bright as a penny, mm. sitting there underneath a dead tree. Yeah. Like you couldn't have missed it, sort of thing. Like, like it had been placed again, placed on yeah. a trail. Yeah. So, so it would be found. over that whole year. Yeah. Over that whole year, so, yeah, you would have found something along there. Yeah. Um. So they conducted the search of the area, mm. and they found a pelvis, one of his femurs. Um. That was all. They seemed like they were partially buried on a cow trail. Yeah. As well, um. They found Aaron's cell phone. 
Yeah. And they found his, it, a, like a thin sort of jacket as well, yeah. like a sports jacket. Sort That's of thing. right. Yeah. Like an underlayer sort of j- j- jacket. Yeah. 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 Like a one to go over your t shirt, but underneath your main jacket sort of That's thing. That's it. Yeah. What the coroner could not determine was a cause of death. Now, obviously, because it was skeletal remains, yeah. which does make it difficult to yeah. determine a cause of death, but there was no, so there was no damage. Bones. Yeah. Or the bones that they had found, because they, he did say they didn't find any feet. Yeah. They didn't find any feet. They didn't find his trousers. Just his um, shin bone or whatever, yeah. But of what they did find, there was no injury to it at all. Mm. Um, now, this is what's important to note with, with regards to Aaron's remains. Aaron's remains were found 11 air miles from the point of separation and six miles from where his boots were found. Now, if he was hypothermic, he wouldn't have made it that far. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, he wouldn't have. He would not have made it that far. He would not have walked a further six miles with no shoes on. Whilst hypothermic, yeah. Whilst hypothermic, and oh. sorry, that was so worth mentioning as well. Where in and around the area in which they found his backpack, they found a thermos flask with an um, right. open yeah. energy drink can as well. Yeah, Ope, yeah, an opened yeah. energy like, literally, drink can. Like someone had. Unscrewed the lid. Had a cup of just, tea. Yeah. In view of the Ryan's farm. Yes, yeah, so they they right. saw the Ryan's uh, farm buildings. So even if you were lost and in a bit of trouble, you would have seen those buildings and known. Right. Well, that's the direction I need to head in. But the thermos mm-hmm. had been sort of the, the lid had been unscrewed, and again just placed next to the the thermos on top of a rock. And then there, yeah. as you say, there was the empty energy drink can. Um, sort of next it's to it. It's crazy. It makes Nuts. no sense whatsoever as to... Well, I mean, they've been able to trace supposedly where he's been moving to. Yeah. And it just... None of it makes any sense. None of it is, seems even no. possible. Um, but there is one last case that I want to talk about. And it doesn't necessarily um, attribute to any particular missing person in particular. No. But it happened incredibly close proximity to Yosemite National Park, which, as yeah. I previously said, has over 50 plus missing people that fit in that part, these 11 yeah. criteria. Yeah, that's right. It's, it's the biggest cluster in the world, according to Politis. Mm. It's the biggest one going. So this is um, uh, talking about Sierra Camp. Yeah. Sierra Camp is um, it's not too far from. Yosemite National Park. It seems like it's the Sierra Forest near Sonoma, yeah. California. Mm. Now, this hunting camp dates back to the 1950s when it was first um, founded. Yeah. And uh, by proximity only, it's worth exploring the, the strange occurrences. Mm. Now, this is told by Ron Moorhead. And the he tells a story of when he used to go up to this secret camp called Sierra Camp. Um, and he's been going there since 1971. Yeah. Now he stopped, um, it's worth saying that he stopped hunting up that way in the late eight, in the late seventies, yeah. but still goes up there every year because to, to camp it's a tradition between and... himself and these three other um, friends, these yeah. three other campers. Now this is worth noting as well. It's a very, very disciplined camp. There's no alcohol at all. There's not even like a like a quick brew around the campfire. It's a very very disciplined yeah. camp. This one, well, now, and it's very um, it's it's sort of very well respected amongst them as as hunters and and hikers because they refused to give the location of the camp to yes. Polidis because they didn't want it to become a tourist trap because it was still in immaculate condition mm-hmm. um, and was peaceful up there and that's why they picked it. So they they even refused to give away the location. Yeah. For that reason, so it gives you an idea on how they sort of respected the the area. Oh, 100 percent. And it's um this this particular the reason why they kept going year on year is because they kept coming across these very, very strange occurrences. Now, mm. what would happen was that each time they camped up there, they'd hear these strange noises at night. And as soon as they'd hear these these loud noises, um, they knew it was actually time to you know, turn in for the night and they barricaded themselves into this like makeshift hut that they'd made right. out of a, a series of logs placed next to each other. And uh, it was set in between these trees as well, which yeah. gave it a bit more structure. It was quite handy, um, wasn't it? Because when you see the, <clears throat> when you see the the documentary, they, they, there was like four big like redwoods in, in the shape of a square 
mm. that they used to make their little kind of hired or you know little, yeah it's like it was perfectly it's yeah. like nature decided to give them a helping hand so yeah thing. exactly yeah it's like, yeah, boys, it's like yeah there you go camp. there's a place to put your yeah. you know, your hunting hut yeah exactly um, which was incredible i mean it's, it was almost it's almost um like uh, the sort of thing you do as a kid in the woods where you mm. gather, gather a load of big sticks and you put them against the tree and create a like yeah. a teepee sort of thing yeah exactly yeah but then they fashioned um a, a door out of a much larger log and they secured it with wire once they were all inside mm. so this this door was not moving and when they did finally get in that's when the sounds actually got louder and like i said in 1971 that's when ron first started going to the camp um, but it's also when he started listening to these sounds and hearing these sounds and they actually started recording them. So they did, yeah. Tell me what you think of this, Cal. <laughs> That's actually the hunters living to this down there. Yeah. There's two of them across the creek at the big rocks. I have no idea I mean, how to is, take that. I mean, that that's nuts. I mean, when you consider that in that region, 50 plus people have all disappeared under mysterious circumstances and you're hearing that shit at night, I think that might I, just tell you why or what's, you know, causing their <laughs> disappearances. To be honest, that's given, I've got goosebumps listening yeah. to that because there is chatter going on in there. There's talk, there is, there's communication. Yeah. It's, it's, weird it's, it's a conversation really, really weird. Now, I, for those that maybe didn't hear during the audio the the audio that was sort of closer that the, the louder audio was the was ron and his his buddies mimicking the sounds that he could hear so the the loud but kind of further away audio that you could hear was the mm. reported uh creatures um i would recommend actually going back and listening to it with a set of headphones because yeah my god do you hear so much more of it and it's, oh, you hear stuff, it's yeah. Haunting, it really is. Now, oh, it is. Ron and his team were really quite responsible with regards to this. So, I mean, yeah. they've done a great thing by recording it. Now, they needed to get scientific validation. Um, so, what they did was they submitted the tapes to uh, a Dr. R. Lynn Curlin, uh, who is a professor of electrical engineering. Sorry, electrical engineering. Mm. <laughs> 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 uh, at the University of Wyoming. Yeah. Now, the analysis revealed that the sounds were made by a creature physically larger than a man, based on the pitch and sound height estimated to be between seven foot mm. three and eight foot. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> there was more than <laughs> one creature being recorded, which they state yeah. in that. They confirmed There's themselves. There's two of them yeah. over there by the rocks. Yeah. But even the sound, the, the, the professor, Dr. Um, Dr. Lynn Curling, they even determined that there is two on that recording. Yeah. The format frequencies found were clearly lower than a human, and their distribution does not indicate that they were the product of a human vocalization or seed, or seed alteration. Yeah. Now, it also concluded that the tape shows no indication of being pre-recorded or re-recorded. Yeah. 
or tampered now, with in, in any way. We're not saying what that is. But I think you can maybe but, figure out <laughs> where we're leading. Hey, hey, listen, I'm not saying it's Bigfoot. But, but it's Bigfoot. It's Bigfoot, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, 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 that's not the only thing that they've experienced up that way as well. Um, no. As well as these strange sounds which happened regularly on yeah. each of their trips that they'd be up there, the hunters have heard um, other strange sounds. Um, one time they heard a, like what they described as a huge tuning fork sound mm. coming from above them. Mm. But as they looked up, they're like... There's nothing now. So no, nothing visible. Up nothing there, up there to cause the sound, but that's what was carried. Yeah. Clearly, clearly a high ting. Verberation of something. Yeah. Yeah. So um, another, they all heard, they all heard their kit being thrown around outside yeah. of their, their hide, outside their little hut pots and pans being smashed about and all their kit being thrown everywhere. But yeah. when they came out and had a look, nothing had moved. It was immaculate, yeah. Absolutely immaculate. So it recreated um, the sound of their camp being absolutely trashed and torn apart. Yet, as you say, when they finally came out of their hide mm. to sort of investigate, their their camp was untouched. Yeah. Was perfectly Here's fine. an interesting one, though. And I want to harken back to the first one that I spoke about. Go on. They also heard a car door slam. In the middle of the forest, they heard a door Yeah, slam. he does mention, Ron says that, doesn't he? Yeah. That's right. Just like, well, could be just like when the trap Tom Messick slamming. went with the trap door slamming. Yeah. Um, it wasn't just sounds at the, the odd occurrences up there, but they also saw lights in the sky yeah. um, shooting around in various different colours, darting across the sky. Um a large ball of blue light started moving through the trees and he said seemingly with intelligence mm. like there was start Purpose. stop it could yeah. move like you could see it turning left and right yeah it carried on floating um and on another occasion he saw a rod of light he he likens it to a lightsaber he did yeah Float, floating horizontally yeah. through the trees and again were seemingly under control following a direction or go, going to like with a purpose basically mm. and uh again another strange thing that happened 2014 the united states forest service discovered the camp and forced the hunters to remove the stove and the barrels and dismantle the structure yeah so now they they've got none of that up there. They still go to that spot. They still go to the same spot, but they've just not built anything. Yeah, but they just haven't got the structure there anymore. But interestingly, in the documentary, the camera does sort of pan around on the floor, and they sort of highlight in the video images like parts of like their shelter. So it highlights the giant log that they use as their front door, and it highlighted the four trees that they used as the main right. walls of the structure. And so stuff. it's all but still there. It's very interesting that 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 you know local authority got involved for seemingly no reason mm. but well, it's a federal but federal just, yeah, authority but just decided it's... to tell them to dismantle it yeah that's to... how odd is that i mean they're even going up there to i'm assuming to this day and they're still got these still strange occurrences it. i think every year they say they hear the same sort of noises and the same sort of strange occurrences but they've, they've mm. never been able to um get video that they videoed the creek or the side of the creek from where the the chattering was coming from but they could never pick up any visual um evidence yeah. it was only over the audio so taking into account everything we've spoken about tonight <laughs> <laughs> what side of the fence are you coming off of what's going on man what do you think's going on what do you think i mean we've got a, i mean <clears throat> like we said uh, when we introduce the episode in, uh, you know, at the end of episode 10, you know, we've got to treat this with delicacy and, you know, mm. a certain level of respect because these aren't stories, you know, these disappearances did actually happen. They are real life missing person cases, some with, you know, closure, some, some not so lucky. So, but taking into account the, circumstances surrounding the, the, the disappearances the the 11 criteria um and just the fact that these people seemingly vanished in in thin air mm. i guess i've got a claw back to um 
episode one and and my theory with with how the you know the the Bigfoot travel and and go down the you know the interdimensional um, route. Yeah. Um, now you know I, I don't think I can say one way or another whether it's you know fairies, Bigfoot, or whatever. But there is a presence. There are creatures or, or of some sort that are traveling into dimensionally now whether they just happen to uh, you know open up a you know portal, like a portal or, something. or something yeah yeah, yeah. exactly where these people yeah. happen to be standing and it's just rotten luck that they disappear at the same time or whether there is an intent and you know clawing back to these criteria are they looking for you know the young you know are they looking for those with you know sort of disabilities or vulnerabilities mm. I, I, you know, I don't know whether there's necessarily a plan plan in that, but there's there's nothing within our understanding or you know even our realm that can explain what happened to these people, why it happened to these people, and there's nothing logical that that kind of backs up any of the circumstances or the criteria and why that criteria is so common throughout all these. Um, you know, cases now we've only gone over the the more compelling ones that are mostly highlighted in the two documentaries but dave Pelidis, across his 12 books investigated over 1200 individual missing 411 yeah. cases i so think these are the only it works out to be over 1400 1400 Inter- right 1400 yeah. so he's added over 200 more to that since the documentaries came out mm. which is an incredible amount of people to be going missing yeah. in such a short space of time in, in general but to be well. to be in these clusters but also yeah. under these criteria yeah because i mean you take into account things like uh mental illness and stuff that being like the number one reason to yeah for it not to be part of the the 411 cases yeah is especially today is going to be quite high really it is a lot of people yeah. do go missing think... because of mental health issues yeah, I, I just think as well, like with with the way these people are disappearing, and the fact that Pelidus has been able to put together this criteria. With all that being said, agencies like the CIA, the FBI, the, these greater government agencies in the states aren't getting involved. They're not making it yeah. kind of their problem. They're saying it doesn't meet their criteria, and you just think, well, there's something strange that's going on. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Whether, whether it's by by humans and it's some sort of like human trafficking or you know whether it's just unfortunate accidents and it is animal mm. deaths you know there are too many clusters within canada and north america alone for surely someone to step in before this dave Pelidis to say you know we've got something going on here in our na- national parks which is supposed to be a safe environment for people to hike mm. and to hunt and to camp you know there's enough over a short space of time of these things happening where we surely yeah. need to, you know, get involved. But as we were saying earlier, the um, the National Park Service have seemingly washed their hands of it and and kind yeah. of don't well, we acknowledge that, that we it's said that very very early on that the yeah the National Park Service the, the, the Forest Service yeah. they they don't want to know which is yeah. bizarre. It's it, it's on their territory. It's, it's in astounding. their jurisdiction. Yeah, it's and astounding. It's These people it's, going missing. And you're not yeah. keeping record of like, but if like it was like the hunters, in the documentary then... that well, this is the thing, right? This is what it says in, in the documentary, and it makes a very, very good point. If that is the data, if the wilderness really is that dangerous, the people should know about it. Because we already know exactly, it's dangerous. Yeah. yeah. But if we only know it's say this much dangerous, which yeah. I'm I'm moving making a very, very small amount of space between yeah. my hands. 10, 20 when actually range, it's a much yeah. larger yeah point of danger that's, that's you should right be made there, aware then, but absolutely the fact they don't but even then, log it like they don't even have nothing even if it's just like a paper a paper note to say so and so went missing these were circumstances not investigated search any for further. this many days yeah. search called off but after there's literally no record so if down. if the local law enforcement or people like Pelidis didn't go and actually document this stuff there would quite literally be no evidence of mm these disappearances, the the search efforts and and the, the interesting um circumstances in which they you know they all they all happened. And it's just it's yeah, yeah it's just it's yeah bizarre. I I 
there is something there really is something going on here and to ignore it i think is incredibly irresponsible and i, I so. will i'll call out the person who it is that wrote um david polidus's wiki page i'll call that person out because all over his wiki page it's mm. supposedly this supposedly that no connection with this no connection with that pulling up tenuous out, links yeah. the most tenuous links that that Politis has ever made in any yeah. of these cases and they're using those to rip the whole thing apart now yeah. incredibly irresponsible because there is an issue mm. the People authority, are actually authorities are not talking about it they're not mm. investigating it why they this is the thing why are they not investigating it yeah uh, that's the it comes it comes back to that <clears throat> abduction doesn't it that i said in the previous abduction. episode yeah exactly i mean without if it is if it is aliens if there yeah. is alien abductions going on to these people in these areas then that just it should be public knowledge <laughs> the stories what well, yeah. well, th- this should be public knowledge 100 yeah. percent it should be public knowledge. The record should be public knowledge. It shouldn't be the ridiculous um, amount of money that they wanted to charge in order to create such files. Um, exactly. This was yeah. the, the Forest Service. They they said it would cost one point two million dollars in order to create a list of all missing people. Yeah. From that, all their that, national that's, parks. That's yeah. occurred in the national parks. And it would take over twelve Utterly months to ridiculous. compile it as well, wasn't it, or something? Over, was it Utterly over twelve ridiculous. months to compile it? Which is just. Yeah, which is just bizarre. I mean, when, when, when you recap all the, the cases that we went over and the, just the odd distances that these people travelled or that their items travelled with, with mm. absolutely no rhyme or reason. I mean, the, the, the one that, that sort of got me and, and which kind of heavily sort of influences my my theory was the one that happened to young uh, Jared um, Atadero that we covered in the yeah. beginning. The fact that, yeah, right. you know, a, a three-year-old lad scaled a almost 600 foot elevation scree field yeah. supposedly and yeah. you know his clothing and that was in almost pristine and position as you know as the day you went as well that as a steep yeah. incline <clears throat> no exactly yeah no. it's just yeah it's it's yeah it's just bizarre and all these experienced hunters not doing anything out of the ordinary not trying something new or doing anything staffed staying within the realms of what they understand and what their expertise allows them to do because they understand how dangerous the wilderness is exactly and they're still yeah going missing it's It's things like with uh the um uh what's his name uh thomas messick one that you you covered and then the ron moorhead one you know hearing that that trap door hearing that that slamming shut of of something Mm. is that suggesting that something's opened up they got snatched and then you got slammed shut as like a well, kind of you know we did speak about this like... earlier on in the week didn't we and and <clears throat> from the things that i've listened to read and watched and whatnot the idea that um a snap or mm. uh, a, a slam slamming sound of like a door mm. a lot of people that have like spiritual awakenings experience something like that Mm. And it's like they feel it internally, but they hear it audibly. Yeah. So is that, say, like like what you were surmising, that there is a, a portal that opens mm. and then all of a sudden it goes slam like that yeah. and it's closed. That's like when it. you hear no a, way of it getting back out about. Like when you hear a, a jet fl- <clears throat> flying over and, make, and breaking the, mm. s- the sound barrier and you hear that kind of cracking. The sonic you know, boom. Sonic boom, that's it. Is it yeah. is it that kind of audible well, experience that you're having from this? Well, this is something that, I, that that comes up quite a lot, and it, it does also this this idea of a sound that accompanies like a like a pop or a clack or a, or a snap or something like yeah. that that accompanies a strange occurrence. So, the one that always comes to mind for me is um, Stephen King's It. Yeah. Now, there's a scene, I don't know if, ever, if, if you've seen the film, you will know the bit where um, Eddie is walking past that house that they're all freaked out about. Yeah. And Pennywise is standing there with that triangle of balloons. Yeah. Right? Now, in the book, it goes into a bit more detail in which he, Eddie's running away, he freaks out, he sees him, he runs away. And it's like he feels there's a great motion. Mm. The energy, the, the, the air around him snaps forward and he hears a... Like that. Like a yeah. Yeah, just pop. 
and then suddenly he's back into the world that he's supposed to be in. Yeah. And Pennywise isn't um manifesting. He's not influencing his thoughts yeah. and his, his his emotions. Now, is that is that something that is possible in this world? Mm. Based on the amount I of stories that I've know. heard, and when you take into account these sort of things, I think it is possible. I think and I think you've I got think to allow the possibility, possible. haven't you, for something like that? Because there, there yeah. is quite literally no... I mean, we always try and see the real world answers. We try and find the real life theories. And the the best agencies in the world haven't been able to, you know, think of one. Now, is that because they actually don't know? Um, mm. And that these things are just inexplicable? Or is it because they are aware of the goings on, but they can't mention it they can't suggest well you know, what let's be mean. honest mate let's be honest if if it turned out that it was possible that we are interacting with on a regular basis beings from other dimensions that mm. live alongside us constantly yeah the world ain't ready for that sort of shit man no. the world ain't ready for it the world can't even stand on its own two feet the world would collapse in on the, itself i think if oh 100 sort of percent yeah, hundred percent. No, so I, I get it, but it's just, and and like we we spoke about it before. You know, we did our you know little sort of pre schedule chat like, 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 like we it. always do, and we just couldn't think of any logical kind of real world explanation as to what happened to these sort of kids and and to these hunters. And when you when you read all of them and and other encounters and other experiences that we've read and researched about, and you know you specifically listen to like the the ron moorhead you know encounter and and his audio it does really only stick whether you want to believe it or not and i appreciate there's people probably now that are going to drop out after after my off the fence <laughs> you know it doesn't it doesn't lead you really any other way other than down that possibility route and and that's something that even you know for me not too long ago i would have thought was was utter nonsense but yeah, you know, like I remember the looks you gave me with some of the shit I came out with. <laughs> yeah, you know. Like, <laughs> and, but again, it gets to a point when you know you go down these rabbit holes, and you go further and further and further mm. into it. You find these things that are, you can't explain, that don't have logical, um, you know, explanations or, or or reasoning. And even the more, most fantastical, you sort of think, well, you know, I, I could I can kind of see that happening. I can see why they would think that, but. But how how did it happen? How did it get to that point? And that's kind of where I am with it. It's kind of <clears throat> these things happened. These kids went missing. Yeah. These hunters disappeared. These remains have been found. You know, there are yeah. there are detectives and investigators in the states that have got forty plus years experience. That are this isn't like the this isn't like the previous episodes where we're just going <clears throat> at stories and folklore. No, these, these are actual happened. real events. And you've got experienced professionals whether they're searchers, whether they're investigators, detectives, they're scratching their heads saying that there is no explanation. This shouldn't have happened or this shouldn't have ended the way that it did. And there's just no other way to, to you know, to point it other than to start going down the route that I've even surprised myself with. Uh, but it only lends itself yeah. to what we first uncovered way back in episode one, you know, with the Bigfoot stuff. And I know my off the fence opinion then even even shocked you um with yeah the, it really did <laughs> into whole, like interdimensional thing but you know like we've it does, other, yeah <laughs> it doesn't surprise people. me this time round though to not be honest, this time no, you, stay, but... you stayed consistent through the 11 episodes at the <laughs> yeah. very least so <laughs> yeah exactly yeah which, but which, i think it's yeah. worthwhile mentioning though at this point we might be getting off the fence but david politis has not no he, he's still very much he has, unsure. He has not said it I think out of respect for those that he's interviewed, really. Yes, yeah. And those that he's interacted with, that he does not give an explanation as to what no. he, he thinks it could be. Um, no. He, he kind of, you could probably argue that he sort of does with the documentary by adding that the Ron Moore, Moorhead yeah, stuff into that's it. Definitely, yeah, well, the, the weird creatures, uh, the, got the, the, Ron... the large creatures. Yeah, exactly. You've got the Ron Moorhead inclusion, which he says when he introduces it, you know, I'm going into this, you know, not because there's, a, you know, a disappearance. It doesn't fit the missing 411 criteria, but, but it's happened in the same it's area. Purely, 
and it's, Absolutely. it's unusual behavior for this area. And so that's why he introduces it, which I think, as you say, he indirectly or at least makes the suggestion that that's maybe where his thinking is leading, but yeah. he doesn't categorically would come make out and sense say it. based on his previous <coughs> books and his previous well, investigations exactly. first before the one, books, before or one, or at least one. his first book, at least. His first book, at least, being being about Bigfoot, that he would eventually go down this sort of route, and it but, does make as as yeah. incredibly batshit crazy as it is that yeah. there is a interdimensional man ape. Yeah. wandering around the, the wilderness potentially yeah. snatching people up yeah it's nuts it's yeah. it's nuts yeah but it's, but it's possible yeah it's possible yeah. which is even this more is the thing i mean fucking hell, what's happened in the past 18 months across the world mate how well, exactly. is this not yeah. possible yeah you know exactly. i think yeah. that there's there's a, definitely a reason as to why the um the american authorities are releasing so much information on ufos or uaps alien encounters and the such because they're hoping which, to deflect deflect from what's what secrets they yeah. actually have because they go well, let's give them this little tidbit to keep them but occupied but this is the mate, fucking... I, I see all that as useless fucking knowledge that yeah. we know there are ufos yeah. we know there are uaps there are literally yeah. thousands of videos and pictures yeah. and everything out there we know they exist that's not news yeah now why are we getting snatched start looking yeah. at the abduction phenomenon yeah that's what they need to do that, they that's need to start the, looking at the that's abduction the thing. phenomenon that's our next bit that we need to look at but then that will show exist. discrepancies in them as an organization and as a government as a nation as you know why aren't they protecting us why aren't they why haven't they told us blah 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 so they'll never be able to release it unless I, yeah. Unless they have a whistleblower of a significant nature, mm. I can't imagine it's ever going to come out willingly. It's it will be from no. leaks or someone Absolutely. will say something and then they'll wind up suicided two weeks and later. You know what? The people that have had abductions as well get true validation and are no longer called batshit crazy. Well, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that is to be honest. I think that's bang out of order. Abductions mm. actually happen. People experience these things. They might not be real world material abductions, like yeah. their body being taken, but spiritual, but their mind at the very least yeah. is being taken, yeah, or a spiritual sort of thing, another spiritual dimension taking, which we yeah. exist that we can't interact with, yeah, at will, at will, that other yeah. things can bring us into it, yeah. yeah. And I, I, that's no, exactly. pretty much where I'm standing on that. That I. So no, pretty much, not thinking Bigfoot, but similar to where you are with it. Well, no, there are that, that, was, beings that, that was my that point. Are yeah. Preying upon us for some reason. Yeah, I, I can't say that it's one creature, one being, whether that be Bigfoot, fairies, you know, whatever. I, I, I can't put a, mm. a pin on what it is that's traveling or communicating with us, but something is. And it's yeah. and it's from a it's interdimensional. It's from a different realm. They can choose. It's to not. It's link not with us. nuts and bolts from another galaxy. No, and that's, no it's something that's already that's here. No, it's something that's already here or that can already access here without us knowing or without our yeah against our it's will, not, as you said. It's not extraterrestrial. It's ultra terrestrial. It's already yeah. here. It's already interacting with us. It's yeah, probably exactly. been before we were. Yes, exactly. Yeah, and and that's that's what it is. So yeah, that's that's kind of my that's my theory um, mm. in terms of what I think these these are. Which and I don't want to, you know, I, I don't want to glamorize what actually happened to these these people in terms of no. their disappearances because it is you know it is horrendous. I wouldn't want to have to go through it, and you know I wouldn't oh, wish it no. wouldn't wish it upon anyone. So I'm not making light of it. I'm not making fun of it. You know, if, if you know, if anything, I'm you know trying to be as delicate and respectful of the situation mm. as you know as, as i possibly can be but the evidence and you know again it was like you know last week if you used to just read the evidence that we've read in these two documentaries plus the subsequent research that we did then there could be 101 things you, you could just put it down to bad yeah. weather disorientation animal attacks something quite real world but you could you could easily <laughs> fob it off like that like that wally that's written in his wiki page you know, you could yeah, exactly, easily yeah. just fob it off, but like just I said, I find that incredibly it, but... irresponsible because there is something going on here. Well, there's nothing um, to back up his 
comments against Polidis just as much as he's claiming that Polidis hasn't got anything to back up what he's saying. So he's, in his eyes, he's no better than what but his thing is, that's, gave Polidis. That's the difference. But, that's the difference, though. Polidis, he's, he's not. He's not saying anything that's actually happening. He was just saying, no. I found a correlation here. And I, I understand that correlation doesn't necessarily mean causation, that there is no, a, exactly, yeah. a one cause that's created all these correlations. No. He's just suggesting but that there there's is something... all these correlations and it's all yeah. very, very strange. As you know, as we've discussed, we don't believe in coincidences and you can't have oh, no. 11 set, you know, coincidences, you know, in speech mm. bubbles. <laughs> Yeah, and, and have them marks and have them as coincidences gets to the point where they're synchronicities they're they're con they're connections they're something that hmm. that consistently happens and that's just uh and, and, and that's just the the yeah it's just the way it points to i, I think you know with the greatest respect to those that hmm. you know went through it and to the you know the surviving families you know like I say I'm by no way just trying to diminish what they went through and or glamorize or dramatize what they went through but from everything that we you know know even at this point only 11 episodes in from the research that we've done and the rabbit holes and the, the rabbit warrens that we've fallen down with this yeah. information things like this are becoming more and more likely um and yeah and then that's kind of where I'm that's that's kind of where I am with it. Yeah. In terms of that being the, the sort of the cause, again, I, I can't put my thumb on exactly what being or creature or entity it is. Mm. Maybe it's a collection of, you know, maybe it's one entity and it just takes on a different form depending on how it wants to present itself, which is why we see things like, like fairies. Like a, and apparition like a Pennywise or something like that. Like a Pennywise, yeah. Takes on the form that it wants you, you to see or, or something. Or, yeah, the... Yeah, so it, it could be something kind of like that, but but yeah, that that's where I am. I and mean, it looks like we're sort of pretty much on the same side of the fence again, but mm. for the you know sort yeah. of for the most part. And again, we took uh, although we watched the same documentaries, we you know we obviously we interpreted different uh, the same elements, but in different ways, and yeah, you know, and still sort of ended up pretty much at the same right. endpoint, really. Great minds, mate. Absolutely, <laughs> sweetheart. <laughs> Stop at <it>, you. <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah, that uh, I think that neatly brings us to the uh, the end of this um, episode, which I know has been it a bit of a, a longer one this time. But again, we had to give the respect to not only Dave Politis and his uh, and, and you know and his documentaries, but also the the cases because again, these are real life cases these did happen to real people you know there are reports cases evidence and everything else so and again i think if we'd come to the same off the fence but glanced over all of the cases people would be listening thinking what the hell are you talking about which could be there could still be there their feeling anyway even after you know yeah. three hours or whatever but hopefully we've given it some credence we've provided the evidence you know and we've we've sort of shown how we've got to you know kind of where we've landed um and so yeah that's where we will end episode 11 um which yeah, i think man. kind of teases up nicely to kind of introduce or it does as what we're going to be doing for episode 12 so what what are we doing cal what are we checking out next we time? we are going to be jumping into gnomes goblins dwarfs and the like hey. um, following on from I sort of last episode uh -oh. and the fairy kind of terminology encompassing a lot of different cryptids legends and, and mm. sort of creatures that that's kind of where it's naturally sort of taken us i think so um i did hear a, a little rumor though i must say a little rumor about you oh here we go gone i heard you were gobbling a bit last night oh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> here he is <laughs> oh, stop it you <laughs> stop it you <yeah>, T <laughs> you weren't supposed to tell anyone that you were a little goblin last night weren't you <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> well, you, I didn't hear you complaining so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. bastard <laughs> very go. good very good yes, mate. So, yeah uh, so we're going to be looking at the uh, gnomes yeah. goblins dwarves and the like and the like and everything that, that sort of encompasses hopefully taking a uh a sort of a lighter tone um next time 
um and uh yeah and that's what that's what we'll be doing so keep uh keep your, your your ears and eyes out for for that one um as always if you have your own stories encounters interactions that you want to share with us um we're on the socials um on instagram and uh, facebook at the moment um we've also got the uh email address that you can find on the facebook which is cryptid rambler podcast at hotmail.com so if you want to get in touch in any way um any feedback any any stories like i say hit us up on any of those platforms and as you know we love to hear from you all and retell your stories if you allow us of course course. um but uh but yeah on that note it's uh it's, it's goodbye from me and it's goodbye from me and remember earth realm we're not alone out there you're like that. <laughs> <laughs> Earth Realm. Earth Realm. <laughs>